Good morning, Astronomy 1020. Welcome uh, to your very first lecture of our Summer 1 2021 course. Uh, we'll be doing these live sessions, uh, provided that enough of you show up and want to participate in them. However, these uh, sessions will be recorded so that people later on at home who cannot attend can watch them and do the work. I also have recordings from previous semesters that I can use in case not enough people show up to justify me talking to myself. <clears throat> um, this seems to be a nice class because uh, we have some returning students who took my Astronomy 1010 course on the solar system, and that's wonderful. Uh, veterans help the course uh, go run smoothly, and they provide a valuable service, Ian and Ryan and Ryan. Uh, for the rest of you, we need to sort of start off with a discussion to make sure you know what you're about to do here in this class. So I guess I'm going to pick on Brooke and Sage a little bit. You guys are up, okay? You, you, you volunteered yourselves right out of the starting gate, <clears throat> which I'm sure you're very excited about. So let's take a look at a little picture together. And this goes out to Brooke and Sage because, you know, the other folks are supposed to know, having experienced my presence in the past. Uh, Brooke or Sage, can you tell me what the difference between astronomy and astrology is? Doesn't have to be fancy. You just have to tell me simple things. Sage, you're muted. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I don't know if it was just like a go for it, but um, uh, astronomy is the study of like outer space and the galaxy and all of that. And astrology is uh, pseudoscience that's um, basically like your uh, <laughs> personality and characteristics and everything are based off where the stars were when you were born. Um, Sage, yeah. you pretty much got it. Uh, you nailed it right on the head. That's that's impressive. So I'm I'm glad to see that the people who are joining my class this semester are knowledgeable and understand the nuances between these things. That's right. Astrology is a pseudoscience. Sage, I like to think of it a little something like this, okay? I like to think of this as being what your everyday astrologer looks like, okay? So this is a picture of an astrologer, and the message of astrology goes, everything's going to be great, you will be rich, okay? Um, <clears throat> or we can take a look at what an astronomer looks like. Do you guys know who this is? How about I name my students from last semester? Didn't write it down. This is Edwin Hubble. He will feature more in this uh, semester's lecture than in last ones, if we can get to enough galaxy stuff. Uh, he discovered the expansion of the universe by measuring the velocities of galaxies relative to the Milky Way. Uh, it's kind of a cool claim to fame to discover that the universe is expanding. Uh, the message of astronomers <clears throat> is a little bit different. It goes, the world is going to end when the sun enters its red giant phase. You can see that the message of <clears throat> astronomy is not quite as uplifting as the message uh, of astrology. People get these things confused, but they're a different caliber of subject, as Sage has pointed out. Uh, astronomy is a physical science, or maybe a natural science. And as such, when you want to publish a theory in this subject, you have a high threshold of publication. You publish your results <clears throat> in a magazine like Science or Nature, some peer-reviewed journal, where one has to first go out, collect data on the universe, maybe in the form of photons from your little telescope here. Okay, You've got to collect some light, and then you have to analyze that light and try to understand the results and test some hypotheses. And before you can publish your crazy theory about the universe in a in a journal like science you've got to you've got to submit your work to a body of enemy professors who are out to get you and after they comb through the material looking for any flaws in your methodology only after you've satisfied them your enemies are you allowed to publish in this type of magazine <clears throat> most of the time when you read your horoscope you're reading it in a popular newspaper like the Providence Journal or even the, the Washington Post probably has an astrology column. Uh, or you could read it like the kids do these days on their co-star. 
I am not sure what the threshold for publication is for a magazine like Dell Horoscope. I think you probably just show up and you have the energy crystal on your forehead and you tell the editor that you're mad in touch with the stars and they say, I love it. You got your deadline on Tuesday, 25 cents a word. Who knows what the criterion is for writing a column like Uranus moves into Pisces, expect the unexpected, okay? Um, <clears throat> Now, it doesn't seem like it's going to be an issue in this class, which allows us to move a little quicker today. I often dictate the speed of my course based on the sort of responses I get from students. And Sage pretty much explained exactly the difference between these two things, which means I can put this into sort of high speed. I don't have to go slow with you guys. Um, I was worried that perhaps you guys might get these things confused because they both have to deal with constellations and stars, but they're very different subjects. You guys know what this thing is, right? What am I looking at here? Okay, Sage. That's the um, chart for astrology, the 12 different signs for each personality type. The 12 different signs. Why don't we have one of my veteran students come up with a better name for that? Can you guys bust out a $10 vocabulary word there? Ian? Ryan? Ryan? No? No. I'll tell you, I didn't really write much down about astrology. <clears throat> well, that's fine. but And it's okay that you don't remember. That's why sometimes doing this a couple of times helps. But there is a name to describe these and Sage, if you look closely, you will discover that there are not only 12. Oh, there's is it Zodiac? That's right. Zodiac? This is the Zodiac. There's actually 13 Zodiac signs, Sage. And uh, these constellations, here's your first vocabulary word for the day. We'll write it down later. It's the Zodiac, okay? 13 constellations. The 13th Zodiac sign is Ophiuchus. <clears throat> How many constellations are there in the nighttime sky? This might be a veteran question. I don't know if they can remember such trivial details. I don't have the exact number, but it's a lot more than that. It's a lot more. Take a guess. Oh. <laughs> uh, I don't know. A few hundred? 88. OK. I was wondering if you would guess over 100 or under 100. Um, <clears throat> There are 88 constellations known to astronomers in the nighttime sky. Just to help you guys under, oh, by the way, um, <clears throat> my voice is a little bit scratchy, so. From yesterday's um, class that I had with my solar system course, uh, not everyone understood the best way to use Zoom during these classes. Anyone watching later on is kind of stuck with whatever I do, but for you guys watching live, I'd like to just point out that in your upper right hand corner of your screen is a little button that says view. <clears throat> and the way I like to do things is when I'm talking to all of you and you guys are responding to me, I like to put it into gallery mode so we can all see each other's faces. From time to time, I might do a demo or I might take some notes on this board here. We're gonna take a lot of notes and you should write down what I write down. For note taking purposes, you should switch your view to speaker view and then make sure you double click on my face so that the board will be large on your screen. <clears throat> I just wanted to point that out because not everybody out there is kind of familiar with how to best use Zoom. So let me know, ask a question if you get uh, a little confused about that. As to the 88 constellations, later on this week, we'll actually get to learn a few of them when we look at this here celestial globe, you know, if you're standing on Earth, the universe extends in all directions, but for the most part, there's only so many directions you can look because you're on a sphere and the sky around Earth is kind of like a sphere. So there's a limited number of directions you can look. I'd like to say something like 360 degrees, but it's actually a three-dimensional problem. But there are a limited number of directions you can look out from Earth and astronomers have blocked out all of those areas and dedicated each one to one of 88 constellations. In other words, there's a lot of constellations on the nighttime sky. Astrologers are only interested in 
13, or more often not, than not, 12 of those constellations. <clears throat> My question then, of course, is why these constellations? Why do astrologers care about Taurus and Gemini and Cancer? Why don't they care about Camillo Pardalis or Volpecula or Hercules? This is a question that veterans could answer perhaps, or maybe not. Do you remember why the astrologers care about these constellations only? Um, Didn't if it... I remember correctly, it's because the sun passes over them. That's exactly it. <clears throat> Um, I don't know what someone else was going to, uh, but anyways, Ian, you kind of nailed it. Okay. So if you look at this other slideshow, maybe around slide, I don't know, 56 or so, let's see. Uh, here we go. Yeah. Oh, here. Earth orbits the sun on something very close to a perfect circle. And as you can see in this diagram, that circle maintains a kind of fixed orientation in space. So... As, as Earth is orbiting around the sun, the sun always appears projected on a limited number of constellations. In March, the sun might appear in Pisces. Uh, in June, the sun might appear in Gemini. In September, in Virgo, and so forth and so on. So these constellations are important to astrology because of the central premise. Let's go ahead and we'll just take a couple of quick notes on this. But basically, I'm, I'm just going to reiterate what Sage said, because he kind of did it right. So we have astronomy versus astrology. And we'll keep this quick, but I do think it's worth writing down. Uh, which one of these markers is my good one? I think this is the good one. <clears throat> So for astronomy, we would have the study of stars, planets, moons, nebulae, nebulae are clouds of gas in space. We'll talk about that. Uh, galaxies. Did you know that there's a branch of astronomy called cosmology. And the purpose of cosmology is to study the entire universe as a physical mechanism. Now think about that. I mean, gee whiz. <clears throat> if your subject of study is the universe, that means you pretty much study everything that is and exists in nature, in, physical, in the physical world. That's a pretty big subject. That means you can really discuss anything as part of astronomy. That's pretty cool. Um, on the other hand, the premise of astrology is, is sort of what <clears throat> Sage and Ian contributed to, that the location of the sun against the background stars. And of course, here's the real kicker. On your B-Day, which is your birthday, is going to determine your personality type and or your destiny. <clears throat> now, in yesterday's course, when I talked to my students, one of them tried referring to astrology, because let's face it, astrology has some mystical kind of vibe to it. You know the types who want to ask you about your signs. That's the hippie chick who's got the you know, sage in the burning in a room and, and, you know, exactly. Right. Um, and I have many friends like that. So not to get, you know, too discriminatory here, but, but the types are a little wee woo, wee woo, as my ex-girlfriend used to say, you know, so, uh, 
So someone in yesterday's class, because of that, referred to astrology as like a religion or a mythology. But in philosophy, there's a difference between things like like science and religion. They're not they occupy different psychic domains. Astronomy is what you would call a physical science. A physical science is something like physics or chemistry. And that's where you, you know, go out and you you take something and you put it into an Erlenmeyer flask and you set it on fire, you manipulate your environment, you test hypotheses. In a physical science, you're you're grappling with physical substances. Uh, but astronomy also has aspects of a natural science, like geology or <clears throat> well, I don't want to say biology because the biotech universe is kind of more like a physical science these days. But in the olden days, if you were Charles Darwin on the on the HMS Beagle and you were counting one, two, three, four Galapagos turtles, usually don't take the turtles and put them into an Erlenmeyer flask and set it on fire. You're more like the passive observer who's looking out and counting things in nature and then trying to deduce your theories. Of course, astronomy has aspects of both. Historically, it was more of a natural science, and it still maintains that kind of old school classy edge. But today, of course, we have robots, tanks traversing the surface of Mars and shooting rocks with a laser gun. We have satellites like the Parker Solar Probe that are flying through the atmosphere of the sun to sample plasma particles. If that ain't a physical science, I don't know what is. <clears throat> but things like religions and mythologies they occupy it. So astronomy, physical sciences, they're concerned with the physical world. The physical world are things that you can taste and touch and smell, and you can measure with your ruler and beat with your particle accelerator. Whereas religions kind of deal with the metaphysical world. And those kind of tend to deal with, you know, ethical and philosophical questions. Like, is it, you know, uh, should I put uh, arsenic in my neighbor's dog food if he barks all day and it disturbs me? You know, like, is this a moral thing to do? Those are kind of questions you want to talk to your rabbi or your Buddhist guru about, you know. Come on, Brent. <laughs> <laughs> Astrology makes the mistake of having a premise that is deeply rooted in the physical world. Because if you take a look at it, you're dealing with the sun, which is a physical object that you can measure. The background stars you can collect light from and you can observe them. Your B-day is kind of a historical fact. Okay, personalities are a little wee-woo, but actually the first thing I'd like to say is any casual observer of the human condition will already know that there are way more than 12 or 13 personality types in nature. So the premise by itself is kind of flawed. Just because you're born on Albert Einstein's birthday don't make you Albert Einstein, okay? And, and, and even so, they try to augment this by, by adding sort of the moon, what's your moon sign and your Vir Mercury rising and all this, you know, Mercury's in Gatorade, so we got to figure out what's going to happen to you. But your personality, people do have personality types that, that you try to describe in like a social psychology book. You can see where you are on the DSM-5 uh, you know, manual of psychic disorders. And your destiny is also kind of a matter of historical record. And it turns out that if you investigate a person's birthday and the location of the sun and their personality type and their destiny, that uh, none of this is actually true uh, if you do it in a systematic way. So this is a false statement. And I don't even need to tell you this because Sage already knew that philosophers have dubbed astrology because of this a pseudoscience. Now, I feel obligated to explain that at the beginning of the course for two reasons. One, even if you drop this class tomorrow, if this is the one thing you take away, that would be pretty cool, okay? Uh, because I will have combated ignorance everywhere. Uh, but if you are taking this course with good intentions and you plan on sticking with it, I would like you guys to know that there's a difference between these things and you have signed up and paid $550 
to learn about astronomy. Okay. So I don't want anyone writing me emails like I've gotten before saying, uh, <clears throat> Professor Britton, I am in your astrology 1020 class. That's going to give me the willies. Okay. That's going to make me want to delete your email and not write you back. So I'd like to avoid that. Um, of course, we're here to talk about cooler stuff, although some of the stuff is kind of related, right? Forget about 12 or 13 constellations. I want to talk about this stuff. What is this stuff? To my veteran solar system students, you're actually going to leave the solar system this semester, and you're going to get out here into the world of nebulies. Uh, do you guys know what this one's called? This is an iconic image. Uh horsehead nebula, but there's Very, another name for it, I thought. Um, it's the horsehead nebula. Actually, a kind of cool side note for people who know what's going on. Do you see these two stars here, Ian? Those are two of the stars uh, from Orion's belt, but you're zoomed way the hell in on them. I think this is Mintaka, maybe. Um, cool. Very cool. We'll talk about the horsehead nebula later on. Uh, this is what the majority of reality, if we're going to talk about the physical world, <clears throat> Most of the physical world isn't the Instagram and, and Nintendo and this other stuff. It's this whole vast sea of vacuum with cold clouds of hydrogen gas and giant spheres of radiating plasma with nuclear reactions in them. Reality is actually pretty effing abstract and strange. And that means it's probably worth finding out what's going on up there. It turns out learning about the universe and outer space, there is a connection to your daily lives, although it's a subtle one, and it's cool to learn about that. So in any case, you guys already kind of knew, I probably didn't have to do uh, quite that much of a spiel, but for anyone watching later, astronomy does not equal astrology. They're not the same things. And with that in mind, welcome to Astronomy 1020, Stars and Galaxies. You're gonna learn a lot about stars and maybe a little bit about galaxies as we go. This is a summer course, of, of course, and that means that uh, we're going to move quite quickly. Each day, we're trying to cover at least a chapter, sometimes more. Each day, we're trying to do a homework in a lab because all courses have some work associated with them. I have tried to design the course, as some of the veterans will tell you, in such a way where you minimize the bullshit and maximize the fun. And we're going to do the lab work together. We're going to do the homework together. All you really have to do is just kind of show up and hang out with me and everything will fall into place, okay? Uh, for people watching later at home on the pre-recorded video, the same thing applies to you. You just got to make time to watch these videos every Tuesday and every Thursday, and I'll have the homework and labs contained right within it so you don't have to do a lot of work on the outside. Um, <clears throat> uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Brendan Britton. I'm a professor of astronomy at CCRI, and I've done this for many years now, and I know all kinds of things about how to run an efficient course. You're going to have to trust me when I tell you to do things. Um, this is a picture of our 16-inch telescope. The CCRI Warwick campus has a observatory called the Margaret Jacoby Observatory, and usually I run that. And uh, we've been closed doing, due to the COVID pandemic, which is quite sad. But starting in the fall semester, um, starting in the fall semester, I'll be opening it up back up to the public on Wednesday nights that are clear. If you guys are on campus and taking courses this fall, even if you're not, if you're just a member of the public, you can come by with your friends or your boyfriends or girlfriends or your parents, and you can take a look through the telescope. And it's kind of a cool thing to do. I'd like to be able to give you guys that experience at some point. Uh, if this were a normal semester and we were meeting in person, I'd probably invite you out at some point just to add to the course, you know, so I don't know. Keep that in mind. I want to let you know there's an observatory on campus. You can look through a telescope at some point. Um, <clears throat> who are you? Well, I know a few of you, so that makes this fun and efficient. Uh, for Brooke and for uh, Sage, and I don't know who we have in the troll department there because I blocked or I hid the trolls so I don't have to look at the blank squares. Uh, I hope you guys are going to show up uh, to class every Tuesday and Thursday with a calculator and a positive attitude because these are going to be kind of long sessions. They're going to be a bit of an endurance struggle to listen to me talk for so many hours. 
Um, so we might as well try to have a good posi mind frame and get into it since we have to be here. Uh, Sage and Brooke, did you manage to get one of the calculators that I emailed the class about? Oh, oh, oh. I like <laughs> it. Ian's got his hot pink one. Sage? Uh, mine is coming in tomorrow morning. I had two scientific calculators and somehow loaned them both out. So oh, that geez. was kind of annoying. So I'm very glad that Brooke has hers. Sage, I'm glad that you've ordered yours and coming in tomorrow is good enough, but I am gonna wanna start training you guys on this today. So Sage, let's come up with a temporary workaround. Um, sometimes there are scientific calculators that you could download for your, do you have an iPhone or an Android or something? Um, speaking from experience from a few days where I didn't have my calculator uh, last semester, if you turn off portrait lock, and flip the regular calculator sideways, you can use a lot of the functions that we need to. Um, that's cool, Ian, and I'm glad for that contribution. The one thing is the buttons were a little bit different. Honestly, yeah, I've got that this was one. the only weird thing. Um, there is one app that's closer to the Casio FX 260 Solar than others. Do you remember which one that was? Uh, what kind of phone do you have? Uh, do you have a phone, Sage? Yeah, I have a Google Pixel. Um... Go uh, if you have an equivalent of an app store. Just type Casio in, and see what comes up. I know that uh... a lot of casino games, surprisingly. Wait, Casio. <laughs> yeah. Casino games? Weird. <laughs> like, it's... I'm looking oh. at this. What do you see? I don't have one of those droid phones. See, like, I can see I can see things that might look pretty close to a standard scientific calculator. Just could you, yeah. just, could you download some free, do not pay for it, download yeah. a free scientific calculator app, and it would be sure. cool. It would be cool if it looked as close as possible to this yeah for sure and um i am also i took a peek at the homework i'm also pretty comfortable with the scientific me method um honestly okay. so i am okay well the, okay to that, follow along that 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 makes me feel good and if you've had some training i do appreciate that no um sage you're going to discover that in this class even for those that do have training I kind of have persnickety particular ways of doing things. And if you would be so kind, I'd like you to try to adapt to my methods. Oh, my methods absolutely. may end up being the same as your methods. So then we will have no uh, daylight between us. But just in case I find that, you know what Mr. Miyagi says in The Karate Kid? He says, if you know like uh, a, a lot of karate, you're on the right side of the road and you're safe. And if you know a little karate, you're on the left side of the road and you're safe. Or sorry, if you know no karate, you're on the left side of the road and you're safe. But if you know a little karate, you're in the middle of the road and that's no safe. And the exactly. same is kind of true with a little bit of training here. Some people uh, have had like a calculus course or some physics courses, but the way I do things is stru just structured a teeny bit different. So uh, we're gonna do the homework together. Even for those of you like Sage who have training and might know a little bit about the subject, Sage, I'd still like you to do the homework with me, mostly, oh, for, mostly for style purposes. A lot <laughs> of this is about formatting and style, and you'll see that there is some logic to that. But okay, that's great. I Basically, the reason I want you to have that calculator, Sage, is we're going to do in-class exercises here today, and I want you to be able to punch along with us, even if it's child's play for you. That's the only thing I'm thinking about, okay? Okay, so <clears throat> what are we here to do? We're here to learn about the universe and the universe is a cool place. For the most part, this course is concerned with stars. If this course had only veterans in it, veterans from 1010 who had learned the basics of astronomy and some background physics, then I could start on day one with stars. But because these courses do not have prerequisites and they're a mixed bag of people, we're gonna to have to do some fundamental astronomy background stuff and some basic physics stuff for a couple of weeks. For those of you like Ryan and Ian who've taken my solar system course and are trained, and maybe even for people like Sage who have had similar courses, I have discovered from past experiences that
that even you guys can benefit from a little going over there. It does mean, however, that I can move faster, and faster means I can cover more weird and wacky stuff towards the end of the semester. And that should be fun, okay? Um, I don't want to go so fast as to blow anyone out of the water who has not had a science course before, because there will be some people like that. This course probably has about 28 people. Obviously, only a few of you guys could show up, but we want to make sure this is a pleasant experience for those who are a little less well-trained as well. Um, <clears throat> in addition to learning about stars, we're going to talk about the sun. I'll try to throw in stuff on galaxies as well. Uh, this being a summer course, we don't get to do quite as much as we did during the fall, which is a little sad. Uh, but we'll, bet, we'll get to concentrate on it more. And I'll throw bits about galaxy clusters and groups in as we go to make it fun. Uh, because this is a physical science course, as you guys have kind of figured out, there's going to be a little bit of math involved, maybe something about the level of an Algebra 1 class. There are no prerequisites for this course, so you do not even have had to have taken an Algebra 1 class. All you have to be is a reasonable person with a good attitude about life. You have to buy a Casio FX260 solar calculator, and I want everyone to have this calculator so that I only need one set of instructions. And you need to be able to find the buttons that I tell you to and push them when I say go. And if you play along with me, even those of you who are not experienced in math will learn quite a bit as you go. So you just have to kind of come along for my ride. <clears throat> I do need everyone to get that calculator. Even those of you who might be trained, uh, it's quite important that we have one set of instructions each time I have to explain how to do something tricky. And as the class goes on, the, the things that I ask you to do will get trickier and trickier. So Sage, if you, uh, I'm glad you did buy this brand, this model. Thank you. Thank you very much. It only costs about eight bucks at Walmart. So if anyone is watching in the background or watching later on, pause this video, go to Walmart and buy this calculator for eight bucks. There are two variants of it that are actually the same. Um, <clears throat> There is the original Mach 1 version. Let me, uh, let me adjust my focus here. How did that work? Where's, they did something to the focus adjust button here. Okay. So this is the Casio FX260 version 1. It's kind of steel gray. They also have a version that's white that's the mock two but they're exactly the same in all respects these have all the buttons that we're going to need in an easy to locate place i also like that it's cheap and that it's powered by the sun that's both symbolic for our astronomy class and uh it means it'll never die on you during an exam it's a great little calculator ian show them the hot pink model if you're feeling yeah. frisky, you can even get it in hot pink, okay? For some reason, when I went on Amazon to get mine, the, the original color was like $12 and this one was eight. So I was like, okay. All right, sure. hot pink it is, yeah. Why not calculate in style, right? Okay, I like it. Um, but those three calculators that don't get, uh, there are other Casio calculators that I don't want you to have. Um, like, this is a Casio calculator, but it's just not the same. It's a line entry calculator. It's, it's actually just too much. It's vulgar, okay? We don't, while this is a fine calculator under normal circumstances, their use of scientific notation is not as elegant as the Casios, okay? If you get your own calculator, you're on your own. Um, <clears throat> don't complain to me if you get lost. Uh, okay, so... Before we get into today's lesson on astronomy, we kind of have to do that little rules of the road thing so that you guys know what I expect of you and how the grades are going to be determined during this semester. So let's go over a bunch of business uh, for a few moments about how the course works. Let's talk about the classroom system, okay? Uh, if you go to Blackboard, you can find the syllabus and the schedule here under this tab on the left. And I've kind of downloaded them here. And uh, the syllabus is the first thing that we want to take a look at. It's mostly just fluff. The only things that might be useful to you guys are 
You've got my contact email. This is my cell phone. You know, in a normal class, you'd be able to come to my office and talk to me. Here, we're all doing this remote Zoom thing. I don't mind, I'm just a regular fella. And there, there's nothing special going on in my life where you can't send me a text or call me if you're in a jam. And sometimes that's just a faster way to resolve a problem. And as long as you can put up with whatever state of confusion or inebriation I'm in, then uh, I have no problems if you wanna call me or text me and ask a question. You could also send me an email. If you ever need a personal one-on-one -on -one meeting, we could try to set up a time to do a one-on-one -on -one Zoom. I do that for students all the time. That might be especially helpful if you're working during the day, if you cannot attend the live session and you're watching later, if you need to get in touch with me, just do it. People have already started, I expect it, okay? I'm, I'm, the doctor is on call. Uh, other things, uh, <clears throat> I've listed the books, oh here. Uh, the way our course is gonna work is this. Every Tuesday and Thursday we have lecture from 12 to three. I'll try to give you a little tea break in there because it's, boy, it's hard listening to someone speak for such a long time. Even an hour is kind of excruciating. So three hours is really bad. So we'll try to have a little break in between just to relax and eat a sandwich or something. If you guys don't think that's helpful, we don't have to do it, but I, I think you'll probably enjoy that. Um, we have to do a lab every class because this is a lab course. So our lab will be after the lecture Ostensibly, it's scheduled 3 to 4.30, but to be honest, I try to chop some parts down to make it a little more compact. I'll try to have us out of here by maybe not exactly 4 o'clock, but just a teensy bit after 4. When possible, I try to keep it down to an hour just because I know you've got other stuff to do. There are homework problem sets. I'm glad to know that you checked them out, Sage. Um, rather than do the homeworks on our own, which leads to chaos and bad times and people just not doing it, I've decided that I'm going to host an office hours section, uh, session, excuse me, and I'm going to do it before class every day from 10 to 12. In theory, these are optional, but they're really not optional because you need to do homework. If you do the homework on your own, it will take you longer than two hours and it will be less fun and it will be stressful and you'll probably do a bad job and upset me and I'll give you a bad grade. If you do your homework with me, it will get done faster, more efficiently, it will be perfect and it will help pump your grades up. And we'll even have a tiny bit of fun. Well, you know, fun. It won't be like taking a roller coaster ride, but it, it will be as, as literally unpleasant as possible. And what's great is once you do your homework with me and you do your lab with me, you've got all your work done for the class. I'm not gonna ask you to write a term paper or work in a group project. It'll all be kind of contained in the can and then you can focus on your life outside of that. If you um, can't, oh yeah, questions. <clears throat> uh, are the homework sessions gonna be recorded? Of course, absolutely. Ian, you know what's funny? I already have the homework sessions pre-recorded from the previous semesters. And I could just kind of dump those on you, but since some of you, and we should talk about that next, those of you who have showed up seem to be suggesting to me that you appreciate the live experience. And that's a service I'm happy to provide. Technically, this course is an asynchronous course. The videos are recorded, I can deploy the videos, and you guys can watch them on your own time and be responsible for the work. I have decided to redo the whole hamster wheel again so that you guys can have a live experience and kind of interact with me. The rule that I had in mind is that I would only do it if out of 28 people, at least five people would share video with me. Now here we have four and we have some trolls in the background. I'd say that's good enough, but listen guys, if it gets to a point where you don't really care and you would just rather watch the pre-recorded video, I'd rather not do this for nobody's sake. You know what I mean? Like I, if I, you, asynchronous is great for me. I give you past me in a video and I go out and ride my bike in the sunshine. That sounds like a great deal, okay? Now it's, it's not quite that simple, but it's kind of that simple. I am offering to spend this time so that you guys can have that live experience as if we were in a classroom. And if it's something you appreciate, then I'll do it. 
one or two people is kind of not enough to make a compelling video or it just starts to be like, I don't know if this is worth my time. But if it's four of you and if Ryan is going to get a camera and if there's a couple of trolls that want to slink around in the background, I would call that acceptable. Okay, so Ryan and Ian already know the drill. That's why they're here. How about Brooke and Sage? Do you guys like that live experience? Are you just here to kind of check out what the course is about? Talk to me so I know what's going on. I mean, I'm about it. Uh, <laughs> okay. Say, I'm oh, sorry, Brooke. Yeah. Brooke, what do you think? I like it. I like it better this way because it's like easier for me to understand rather than just watching a video. Yeah, it's kind of, I, I, I think I would feel the same way. I think the live thing kind of forces you to engage. It's real time. You could yeah. ask the professor if you get stumped. <clears throat> yeah, I feel um, like I'm doing this through like conversation. So this is much better for me. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I'm not sure. You know, one student that I asked a semester ago really made a compelling argument the other way. He said, honestly, Brendan, I kind of liked the pre-recorded video because I could kind of pause it and I could answer the door, get the mail. So I could see both sides of the argument. But I want to provide this service for those of you who do like it. If something happens, comes up one day, like I got to do a really important errand, maybe once or twice I'll foist the pre-recorded video on you. But for the most part, if I'm hanging out at my house, I'm down to do this and give you that experience, okay? Um, let's just kind of go forward and see what happens. I hope you will forgive me though. If it, in, in previous classes, there's like a lot of people that show up the first couple of sessions and then sometimes it drops off as shit gets real. If it starts getting down to one or two people, I might just say, well, guys, don't make me do four hours for two people. It's not even gonna be a cool video, you know? So. I don't know. We can horse trade as we go forward. You guys could talk me into just about anything. So just remember, if you cannot attend the live video, that's okay. You can watch these later. Ian, if for some reason you can't make the morning homework sessions, we could we could do those pre-recorded. You could either watch the old ones or you could watch. I'll try to record them each day uh, that I do them. Okay. A note about posting videos. After this session is done, it's several hours long. So when I end the session, it takes sometimes almost two hours to render the video. Then I have to upload it to YouTube, which takes another half an hour. So if the course ends at 4 p.m. ish, I probably won't have the video up until at least six o'clock, sometimes 6.30. Every now and then I get distracted and I start doing something in my personal life Every now and then I forget to post the video. If that ever happens, especially to those of you watching later, give me a call and say, hey, Brendan, where's that video? And I'll say, oh my gosh, you know? So I wanna let you know that that's okay if I ever do that. But you would feel the same if you were in my shoes, you're not just gonna sit there for two hours and watch the video render that you get on with your life and you do something. So I tr it's usually in the back of my mind, but every now and then I forget. Um, let's talk about doing work and homework stuff. Uh, so, so now you know about the syllabus a bit. Uh, we could talk about the books. Honestly, the only thing you really need to get for this course is the calculator. If you want to have a textbook, the book that we'll be following along with is the half version of The Cosmic Perspective by Bennett Donahue et al. You guys only need the, co the component that says stars, galaxies, and cosmology. This is the basic text. Now, there's a full version of the book which you don't really need, uh, but it might be cheaper to get the full version of the book if you get it as a digital copy or as a three ring binder version. I don't know, just get some version of the book. The only thing you don't wanna get is the solar system version. That's for my, uh, these two books, the solar system and stars, galaxies and cosmology are part of the complete text, the cosmic perspective. I've got a copy of it somewhere around here. So either get the complete text or get the stars galaxies component whichever it makes more sense for you i actually have the homework the homework comes from the book but i've scanned the homework problems so i've provided those in the homework session uh section rather um <clears throat> the more important paper that i have to share with you guys is uh the the schedule the schedule is a really important document because it kind of tells you what we're going to do every day and we should follow along with this grid to understand how the class works Today's Tuesday, May 25th, lecture on numbers in space. We're gonna cover chapters one and two, kind of. These are the five homework problems. I am gonna do those with you on Thursday from 10 to 12, 
provided five of you show up to do them, okay? Uh, or this many people is okay too. Uh, the first lab we're going to do today, it's a basic lab called uh, Measurements and Powers of 10. I've loosely based these labs off the now out of print Wilson Astronomy Lab Manual. I've got copies of these because you guys are at home and there's a pandemic. I've photocopied these so you, you don't really don't need to get this. Okay, I can just provide those for you. So don't worry about this. The book could be nice to have if you want to augment these lectures and understand more about what I'm talking about. Follow, if you are the type of student who will read a book, then get the book. If you are the type of student that will not read the book and is just going to use it to prop up your iPad, well then write down everything I write down and show up to all the sessions and you could probably machete chap your way through this thing, okay? It'll be fine. <clears throat> uh, let's take a look at the homeworks and labs right now. So I have to activate them because I just kind of copied this stuff over. Here's our first lab, measurements and powers of 10. I'm making it available because we're going to do it today. If you guys open up this PDF, you'll see this sheet here. Our first lab is going to be practicing some simple calculations and scientific notation. And we're just basically going to practice with our Casio calculators. If you have a printer, you might want to hit print now. I think the only page you're going to need is the first page, 2-5 because I kind of go off road and I add my own little tidbits and I do some different things. So the simplest way to do your lab today is to print that page. If you have a printer, write out the answers. And when it's time to turn it in, you'll take a photograph of it. I think you should send the photograph to your computer. When you upload the assignment from your phone, things get a little bit weird. But if you click on this, and this is important here because people have lots of questions. How do I submit my assignment? You click on lab one powers of 10 and you upload browse local files and just upload that picture of your, of your homework and that will be fine. If you do not have a printer, you've got two other options. One option is to sort of just write this out by hand on a piece of paper and then do the work and submit it to write out the problems. Another option is to try to work on it digitally. You download it as a PDF and you can write and augment on it. But I want your math work to look neat and nice. Uh, Ryan, I just activated it. Could you try it again? Could you uh, refresh? The lab is up for me. Yeah, Ryan, the lab is up now. I should do the homework too. Sorry, guys. I want to get through this stuff efficiently, but these are questions that, that everybody has that we kind of have to cover. Uh, here's our first homework assignment. That should be available now. You can see that I've actually provided the questions for you. I just scanned the pages of the book. We're going to kind of do those homework problems together on Thursday. Uh, unless you've got training in the science coursework stuff like Sage might have, these questions can be real tough even after you've had the lecture. I also have very particular ways I want your work to be formatted. And for those reasons, it's just a much better idea if we do the homework together. That means we, it actually, I believe you can learn a lot by copying and imitating someone who knows what they're doing. That's kind of how we learn things. That's how a carpenter learns things, by watching and practicing what the master carpenter does. So I prefer you guys do not do the homework on your own. I'd like you to do it with me in those sessions. Please humor me on this at first. Okay. They're very so, helpful. Uh, say that again, Ian. I just said they're very helpful speaking. For yeah, they're helpful. And, and we have as much fun as we can have doing them. So I think it would have been a lot more fun, Ian, than doing it on your own, for sure. And plus, sometimes these questions have little background hidden stories that you guys don't know about. And I like to contribute those, tell you about the history of astronomy and stuff. Okay, so um, the way the grading works is it's kind of an equal partition. Uh, showing up to lecture doesn't count for your grade because you paid to listen to me talk about space. And that's great. If you want to pay me and not show up, that's cool too. I, that works for me, OK? Um, <clears throat> however, I am going to be training you during these sessions. So you will find the test a lot more frightening if you don't uh, come to these practice sessions. The lab is worth a quarter of your grade. 
each lab is graded out of 10 points. And I think we'll probably do something like maybe 10 or 11 labs. So at the end, I'll add up all the points that you could have got, that you did get, and I'll divide it by 110 or something like that. And that will be your lab percentage. Your lab percentage is worth a quarter of your grade. Um, the homework is worth a quarter of your grade. And then the last two quarters of your grade is supposed to be 25% midterm and 25% final. What I've sort of discovered is that uh, once you've done the midterm, the, the, the exams are kind of long and hard and stressful. If we do the midterm and you do okay on it, I have such limited time with you guys in a summer class that sometimes I like offering the option of making the final class one more lecture instead of a final exam. So it's sort of like you could spend your last day for three hours being stressed out, taking this wicked stressful test that you probably didn't study for. Or you could spend those last three hours hanging out with me and we'll talk about quasars or something like that, right? So what I may end up doing is allowing you the option of doubling your midterm grade and have your midterm grade count as your midterm and your final so you can weasel out of one of the tests. So with that in mind, let's try to hit that midterm really hard when it comes time, all right? In other words, don't flake on it. Make sure you, you do the exam and show up for that and stuff. If you do all the labs and all the homeworks, you can still pass the class even if you do really horribly on the exam, okay? So there's really strong motivation for you guys to just kind of show up and do all the things I tell you to do. If you do that stuff, there is no way you can screw up this course, okay? So it's not gonna be like you gave it your all and you just weren't good enough. The only thing you could do is be a flake and not turn in homeworks and labs. That's the big mistake to make. So why don't you guys just focus on making it, getting these homeworks and labs in. Now, <clears throat> I've got to grade these things and I've got a lot of students this summer. I've got to grade them in a timely fashion. The due dates each week will be Sunday night at 11 p.m. In other words, this week, we're going to have lab one today. And then on Thursday, we're going to have homework one and lab two. So this week, you'll be doing two labs and one homework. All of those things must be submitted to me by Sunday night at 11 p.m. That's when I will deactivate them. I will grade them. And I want to move on to the next week. I cannot have you guys submitting old stuff on top of new stuff because I just won't have enough time to do it. Do you understand there's like a physical limitation and that's that I am a human being and I deserve love and respect like everyone else, okay? So I think even if you're watching the recorded videos later, if I post them on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, that should be enough time for you guys to squeeze out two hours to do that. Does that sound reasonable? Okay. Because you can tell me otherwise and we'll talk about it, but I, you understand that I do need to have a cutoff each week just so that I can keep up with the work. Because if I'm trying to keep up with the new stuff and people are submitting me old stuff, it's just, it's too much. It's mad. I tried it. It doesn't work. Okay. I definitely don't want someone trying to submit all of the work from the semester on the final day. And I've had people do that and it really pissed me off. That's why I have these rules now. Okay. Um, okay. So every week, the work that we do that week has a deadline, Sunday, 11 p.m. Uh, last semester, it was Saturdays. But I found that sometimes people who are working during the week really, really could use that Sunday. So I'm sort of, my thinking is evolving as I do this, okay? All right. Um, luckily, I'm not an art teacher. I'm not going to look at your crappy little sculpture and make it up at the end of the semester. Oh, that's like a B minus sculpture. I don't know. How do those teachers do it? Your grade is a number system. I'll help you put the numbers in if you show up and hang out with me. Then I hit enter on my computer and your grade pops out. So it's up to you to move around the Candyland board and to put those numbers into the slots. Okay. As a former art student, that is kind of what it feels like. <laughs> Pretty much, right? <laughs> I, I mean, art is like that. If you think about art as a career, you've got a situation where there is no relationship between the, the item for sale and the price of the item for sale. Like 
there's 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 no rational way to judge those two things. That makes me incredibly completely subjective. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's cool if you are Jackson Pollock and you throw paint at a canvas and suddenly it's worth a million dollars. But otherwise, if you're not him, it's probably not so great. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I went over that as quickly as I could. Do you guys have a pretty clear sense of of what I need from you and how your grade's going to be determined? There will be a slight curve on the once I mix together the lab, the homework, and the exam, I usually apply a gentle curve so that people who are not experienced in science don't get beat up too hard. Um, I'll explain that at a later date when it will make more sense, okay? But all you gotta do, the simple answer is just show up, do the lab, do the homework, get them in by Sunday, and everything else is gonna take care of itself, okay? All right, cool. So how are we doing on time? I actually got that done, but... Oh, I guess I took a whole hour to do that. That's not good, uh, but that's how this works. Let me say that there are also some crappy outlines of what I'm gonna do each day. So in this other section here, you see lecture notes, okay? By the way, I'm gonna have PowerPoint slides and those are in the PowerPoint section. But in the lecture notes section, I have some crummy Roman numeral outlines about the lectures we do each day. You guys just had lecture zero, which was an introduction to 1020, talked about astrology, talked about the universe, talked about the classroom, we did all that. And now what we're doing is we're moving into lecture one. And these are some of the subjects that I'm gonna try to talk about. I hope I can get all of this done, but I probably can't. We'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, <clears throat> those sheets sometimes have conversion factors. I strongly recommend that every time I give you guys some notes that you write down exactly what I write down, that will be your study guide and the things that you're gonna use, okay? Okay, so um, let's also say that Ian, if you can help remind me to give a little break, let's do a module or two, and then around 1.30, we'll take a little tea break to refresh our minds a bit, okay? So let's see if we can work out a module uh, before we get into it. Uh, in the first lecture, we're going to talk about some basic stuff that you need to know in, in order to understand and talk intelligently about the nighttime sky. So I've opened this uh, slideshow here, oops, uh, with sort of a picture of a famous constellation. You guys know what we're looking at here, right? What is this? Orion. That's the constellation of Orion. And you can see the three stars of his belt. Um, you can see his shoulders. One of the shoulders is a famous star. That's the star Betelgeuse, just like the name of the movie, the Tim Burton movie. Betelgeuse is a red supergiant star. In your first homework assignment, you're gonna calculate the diameter of the star Betelgeuse. And I'm gonna teach you how to do that. So I need to talk to you guys how to think and talk intelligently about stars how the nighttime sky moves, so forth and so on. Uh, we'll talk more about the movement of the constellations later. Let's just leave that behind for now. Okay, so let's make sure that you also understand that you're on planet Earth. Planet Earth is one of, one of eight planets in our solar system. If you have any confusion about this, the solar system is the sun, our star. It's eight planets. We've got some dwarf planets like Pluto, Eris, and Ceres. Those are things that are too special to be considered an asteroid, but you know, not quite a planet. Let's leave it at that for now. There's an asteroid belt somewhere between Mars and Jupiter. There's two different realms of comets. Some of the comets hang out with Pluto outside of Neptune. That's the Kuiper belt. There's a whole nother reservoir of comets called the Oort cloud. Do I have a picture of that? Oh, damn it. I, I have this slide in my other slideshow that's, in fact, I'm gonna call this up. I should steal this slide because I want it. Here's a nicer picture of the solar system that's probably a little more appropriate for our course. Okay, let's try that again, function F5. So. Um, the solar system is the sun, the planets, some asteroids, some comets. 
Um, the, the solar system sort of ends at the boundary of the sun's magnetic fields. We call that the, the heliosphere or the heliopause. There are some comets that exist between the sun and the nearest star to us, Alpha Centauri. What happens if we leave the solar system? Where are we then? In the galaxy? Yes, what's the name of our galaxy? The Milky Way. That's right. Here you're looking at an artist illustration of the Milky Way. Sage, why am I not showing you a real photograph of the Milky Way? Why am I showing you a picture? I'm not sure, because I think we have pictures of other ones. Are we too close? Kind of, yeah, too close. We're inside of it, right? Yeah. If a ladybug is on a leaf inside of a forest, she can't take a picture of the entire forest because she's in the forest, right? Now, in theory, a ladybug could fly away from the forest, but we don't have enough time or the technological capability to leave the galaxy. It's too far and you'd have to move too fast, okay? We do have pictures of other galaxies, but ironically, Sage, the only galaxy that we can't see well is our own because we're inside of it. Now, Sage, I just lied to you. We do have pictures of our Milky Way galaxy, but they don't look like other pictures and you're not ready for it yet. At some point, I will show you a picture of the Milky Way. But as you're inside of it, it's a different kind of thing, okay? For now, we're just gonna look at this picture or we could look at a picture of our sister galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. That's probably a pretty good idea of what our galaxy might look like if you could stand outside of it. Um, what is a galaxy? It's a collection of stars, most of which have planets orbiting around them. And galaxies also contain tremendous quantities of gas. So it's stars with their planets and gas, and they're all swirling around each other in a big kind of disky spiral. We're going to have to talk about large numbers in this class. Our first lesson is going to be on scientific notation so that we can learn how to talk about great numbers of things. Um, so let's do that together. Okay. <clears throat> lesson one. Scientific notation. I know that my veterans have learned this. Sage, Brooke, have you done this before? Definitely Sage has. How about you, Brooke? Have you ever done this? I like remember it a little bit, but. Okay, not, not, not super confident, okay. Scientific notation is how we write and how we talk about big numbers. Oh, also small numbers too. As an example, let's discuss the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. It's damn close to well, it's not super close. It's just under one trillion stars. Sage, would you happen to know the number of zeros in a trillion? 12. 12, nice. Let's write that down too. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 stars. Now, Sage might already understand why we need to do this, but let me demonstrate with our Casio calculator for anyone who doesn't understand the problem. This calculator has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 decimal places available to it. The number one trillion has 12 zeros and a 13th digit for the one. That means I cannot write the number one trillion down on my calculator. And one trillion is one of the smaller numbers that you're gonna be using in this class. It's actually a pretty small number as far as astronomers are concerned. 
So we can also, that's too many zeros for me to look at when I'm grading your paper. It's gonna to lead to mistakes. We need a new way to write big numbers that doesn't involve writing down all these zeros. Um, <clears throat> let's start off by diagramming this number and then we'll talk about how we're gonna do it. So just some basic terms for a second. The number one here is what's called our lead digit. The lead digit is the first number in your number provided that it's not zero. So a lead digit can be one through nine. Nothing more, nothing less. Then we have this bit here, and we could call this by a bunch of different names. We could just call it the number of zeros. That's probably the simplest way to do it. Um, another way to refer to this number is we could refer to it as the order of magnitude. That's kind of a classy way to do it. The order of magnitude tells you the rough size of a number. It doesn't worry about the particulars and the details. It doesn't matter if it's 1 trillion or 2 trillion or 3 trillion. It's a number of order trillion. It's a number of order 100. It's a number of order 1,000. So in other words, the order of magnitude is basically the power of 10. Then lastly, there's this little part of the number. This is called the unit. The unit is the tag, the tag that tells us what we are measuring. Science distinguishes itself from other branches of, of academics in that science ultimately is concerned with measurement, okay? That's what science really is. It's about measurements. And when you measure things, you always have to ask, what am I measuring? Am I measuring in centimeters? Am I measuring in meters? What are my units? By keeping those little tags with the numbers, you are constantly thinking about what it is you are measuring. So I'm gonna expect you to always keep units with your numbers and I will punish, punish you harshly if you forget to do so. We will be using those units to great advantage in this class. <clears throat> okay. Let's focus on the number of zeros of the power of 10. If you're good at math, you remember some things from your math class. Like you can express zeros, 10 to the power of one is like 10 times one, and that's 10. And 10 to the power of two is 10 times 10, which is 100. 10 to the power of three is 10 times 10 times 10, and that's a thousand. If you keep playing this game, pretty soon you stop needing to multiply the tens together and you realize that what 10 to the three really means is it means a one followed by three zeros. And at that point, you don't need to try to multiply the tens anymore. You could say that 10 to the four was a one followed by four zeros. So 10 to the four is 10,000. And 10 to the five, why that's 100,000. It's a one followed by five zeros. You guys try it. What is 10 to the power of zero? Uh, that'd be one. That's right. Because it is a one followed by no zeros, right? Remember that if you take away this 10, the one remains, not a zero. In algebra, one is the default number. Zero is actually kind of an abstraction, right? One is the default number in algebra. Okay, I can use these powers of 10, it sounds like you guys remember all that, to compact these zeros into a more convenient form. What I will do is I will simply write down my lead digit, one. I'll pack those zeros into a power of 10, times 10 to the 12, and then I will write my units down afterwards, stars. That is how we write 1 trillion in this course, 1 times 10 to the 12 stars. <clears throat> Would you guys mind if I erased this bit here? Brooke, have you caught up to us? Here I go, I'm erasing.
Okay, let's talk calculator talk for a second. To help us put things into scientific notation, calculators like this Casio have a conveniently uh, positioned P. Let's see if I can get my focus right here. Whoop, it's too close. It's really sensitive. All right, there we go. The EXP key is your scientific notation key. EXP means times 10, okay? So watch how I put in 1 trillion. 1 EXP 12. That's it. You will notice I did not type times and I did not type 10. I just did 1 EXP 12. Now the display shows a 1 with a little power of 12 out there. And that's because they didn't have enough room to put in the times 10. Calculator space is special. So let me explain why I'm telling you all this. On our calculators, you are going to type one EXP 12. On your display, you're going to see one with a little 12 next to it. But when you write it down, it is your job to retranslate it back into proper math. And I expect you to write one times 10 to the 12 when it goes back onto your paper. The reason why I do not want to see you write this is because one to the power of 12 is not the same thing as one times 10 to the 12, right? One to the power of 12 is one times one times one times one. And you do that 12 times. And that means one to the power of 12 is one. Obviously one is not the same as one trillion, correct? If you write this down on your paper, I'm gonna think you mean that because I speak math. Does everyone understand that it's their job to put the times 10 back in? I don't want you to say this number is one to the power of 12. I want you to say this as one times 10 to the 12. You have an obligation to speak calculator and to translate that back into math. I wanna make that clear. Okay. I suspect that Sage and maybe even Brooke have seen this before. I know Ryan and Ian have, so I don't wanna bore you. But folks, there could be someone watching later who has really not seen any of this and is terrified before. So we're oh, gonna wow. do one, one more example for those people's benefits. Let's show them how to put a random number into scientific notation. And maybe you guys can help me do that, okay? One trillion was pretty easy because it was mostly zeros. Now we're gonna try it in a, in a different way. I'm going to erase here. Okay, one more example, random number. Let's try nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Uh, Sage, how would I say that number? Let's remember what we do, but the commas after every three, right? Uh, so that's gonna be 9,876,543,210. Okay, just wanted to make sure we could all do that. Um, I, um, honestly, I'm a math major. You do not need to pat a pace off of me. Okay. Um, I feel oh, that. Math yeah. That's great. Well, in yeah. some ways, Sage, that actually helps me because sometimes it's kind of cool to ask the person who knows the answer. That helps me in class. Up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm trying to do us a favor here. Okay. So math major, why don't you put this into scientific notation for us? How would you do that? Uh, do you want to round to the hundredth or leave it? Exactly. We're going to leave rounding out of, now see, here's, let's talk about mathematicians for a second. <laughs> mathematicians don't really, they don't care about rounding because they're just lost in abstraction. Rounding is a very important part of science, and we're going to talk about that. But for now, Sage, let's not do any rounding at all. That should be very okay. comfortable to a math person like you. <laughs> so that's going to be 9.876. Five, four, three, two, one, uh, times 10 to the ninth. Ninth power. Now, let's take a look at what he did. Now, in a way, you've got your lead digit, 
you're going to keep the other numbers as if they were left over. I call it change. Okay, so keep the change. All right. So these these are numbers that you slip behind you. You're sort of treating them as zeros, as if they were zeros in the previous number. But what you're really doing is you're you're moving your decimal point. So in the original number, the decimal point was there after the zero. We have moved it up to now being between the nine and the eight. And to get your power, you just count the number of times you move. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Just that simple, okay? Now, <clears throat> this is probably boring the, the beans out of Sage here, but for just, I know there's gonna be people out there who aren't that good at this stuff. And I've gotta get all you mixed bag of vegetables into the same vegetable soup here. So our first lab, this is so important that we're just gonna kind of dedicate the first lab well, we can go as quickly as you guys can, but we're just gonna make sure that you can handle punching some basic things into your scientific calculator. I basically just want you to practice using your EXP key. It's just that simple. Let's come up with a rule in this class. Here's a rule. From now on, any number uh, that is greater than 1 million, and don't forget 1 million means 10 to the six, okay? Any number greater than 1 million must be in scientific notation. I think for now, until you are trained, that's a pretty good rule to use, just good taste. If it's bigger than a million, fine, I'm totally cool looking at 555,000, you know, that's not a big deal. Once it gets to a million, it's more elegant to express in scientific notation. Uh, we'll talk about small numbers during the lab. I also think it would be a good idea for us just to make a very quick chart of some basic terms that I'm gonna be using during the courses of these class. Um, do you guys have all of this down? All right. I want to mention one other thing. If you guys are out buying stuff like Casio calculators, can I? Uh, oh. I'd like to make a recommendation of a couple of cheap things to buy for this class that I think would be a really good idea. And not just a good idea for this class, but I think these are tools that you should have around as a person doing academic work. The first is just a basic little clear plastic ruler. You probably buy it for 50 cents. And uh, the only thing I would ask is because we use the metric system in science courses, try to make sure that you've got, uh, where's my focus here? Try to make sure that you've got centimeters. You can have inches, but I really would like you to have centimeters on one of the sides. I really like the clear plastic rulers because you can kind of see your work underneath and they're really helpful. We're actually gonna use one in our homework on Tuesday. So if you're willing to shell out for just some kind of cheap old clear plastic ruler, get it at job lot, whatever. Um, less important, but I think are nice tools to have. Um, I think it's kind of cool to buy a cheap little um, protractor uh, because circles come up so much in, in astronomy. I like to have a couple of little circle makers around. It's nice for doing academic work. If you really want to be a badass, get yourself a nice little compass, okay? Now, there are crappy plastic ones that don't work well, but one of these kind of, you know, maybe $12 to $15 Stadler compasses, you can, this is a cool tool that you can do intellectual and academic work with, and it's just nice to have around. So if you don't mind shelling out another five bucks or so, get the plastic cooler, especially because you're going to discover that I love to make tables and charts and things. And so that'll help you guys keep your notebooks organized. So I just wanted to mention that. I was gonna say if this last semester is any indication, definitely get a protractor and or a compass because there are a few things that I needed that for and I didn't have one. <laughs> yeah. And of course you can flub your way and fake your way through it and I'll forgive you. But the experience is more rich and rewarding if you can participate in those things, you know? I also think if you're just gonna be a student, those are just the tools that a student should have, you know? All right, so um, let's make a little chart so that people sort of know what I'm talking about. Uh, just some terms here, okay? 
Now, there are many more than just these, but I think these are some terms that for starters, it would be a good idea for you guys to know about. So one, two. Three. Okay. So we have uh, a name. We have a power of 10. And the metric prefix. Okay. You guys see all that? Okay. All right. So I thought that we could do a trillion, billion, million and thousand. These are the ones that come up the most, but there are more exotic names for large and small numbers that we will occasionally touch on just for fun. Okay, so we did trillion, 10 to the power of 12. Does anyone know the metric pre, well, let's do the metric prefixes last. How many zeros are in a billion, Ian? Uh, nine, 10 to the ninth. How about a million? You want me to just keep going? Yeah, you might as well, because I think most of you guys kind of know some of this stuff. Okay, uh, 10 to the sixth and 10 to the third for a thousand. Right. Thousand is three zeros, okay? So do you remember the metric prefixes, Ian? Yeah, um, all of them. Sure, let's uh, do it quick. Okay, tera for trillion. Terabytes. Uh, giga for billion. Gigabytes. And then mega for million. Megabytes and kilo for thousand kilobytes. So just in case you're not super conversant, these are these are terms that I'll use from time to time. And uh, don't worry if you don't know them yet. You'll just kind of learn them by accident as you go. I thought that could be a good chart. If I say billion and you're forgetting the number of zeros, you could secretly look at this chart and no one would be the wiser. Okay. Okay. Cool. Um, I'm glad we get the scientific notation thing out of the way. I'm sorry that I had to bore you all with it again. Uh, but like I said, there could be people watching at home who haven't done this ever. And we need to make sure that they're, they're playing from the same book as us. All right. So uh, maybe before we get into uh, the next subjects are going to be more astronomy related. So they should be uh, better for some of our new students. It's 1.34 for iPhone time. I've got another disconnect, but my, my computer time is out of sync with iPhone time and that makes me nervous. I don't, what do you have Sage on your clock? Sorry, you're muted buddy. Yeah, I also have 134, I have the same. Where? Yeah, 134. Why is my computer clock all screwed up? I don't know, I'll solve that. Yeah. If, I, if it's, huh? I know it was like this last, I fixed it for a while Ian and now it's unfixed again. Okay. Uh, if it's 135, why don't we take a break until like just before two, maybe five minutes of two or something, good 20 minutes, let us chill out, make a sandwich, do something. And then just before two, we'll come back and we'll do some more astronomy and we'll whack that lab out. Does that sound good to everyone? You guys cool with a little break? All right. So what I'll do is I'm going to pause the video so I don't record dead air and I'm going to mute myself so you don't hear me clanking around with dishes but I'll still be kind of here in the room. So if you need to talk to me about something, give me a holler, okay? All right, so I'll see you I guys. Just have, oh, sorry, yeah. I just have one thing before. Um, I have a doctor's appointment. So for like the second half after the break, I won't be able to be here. Okay. I just wanted to join for the beginning, so. That's great. And I appreciate you, you coming for the beginning. So Brooke, what you're gonna need to do is you're going to need to watch the recording. Remember, I, I won't be able to post the recording until it's finished rendering, so it might not be until six o'clock or so. Um, if you get back from your doctor's appointment early and you want to rejoin, you're welcome to do that, okay? All right. Okay, thank you. Yep, we'll catch you next time, Brooke. All right, I'll see you guys in a little bit. Okay, folks, uh, welcome back from tea break. We're going to do a couple more modules, some vocabulary terms, learn our steps of dimensional analysis, I'd like to get into some astronomy 1020 specific stuff if I can, see if I can do that. Um, for starters, uh, let's begin by having a discussion about the orbit of Earth. I'm gonna want us to learn uh, 
just a, a couple of basics here uh, for us to go forward. Uh, just a few vocabulary terms that'll be helpful. So um, in my hand, I have a uh, globe here. So let's get to speaker view. And we're going to be watching Earth spin from above. We can define directions in space, OK? Anything in the direction of Earth's North Pole is going to be north in space. Anything in the direction of Earth's South Pole is going to be south in space. If I were to spin Earth in the proper orientation, I'd want to spin it basically in the direction of Rhode Island, OK? So as seen from above, Earth has a counterclockwise spin like so. And as it orbits uh, around the sun, it also makes a counterclockwise revolution around the sun. And I've got a little slide for that too. So if we were going to look from the North Pole in space, uh, here we go, um, it would look something like this, OK? So here we have Earth's uh, spinning on its axis counterclockwise. We also have it going on an orbit around the sun counterclockwise. Let's just take a couple of quick notes about this and learn a few more vocabulary terms. Okay. So we can title uh, this section of our notes, Earth's Orbit. We first discussed Earth's axis spin. Uh, Earth's axis spin gives rise to a day. You guys should know that one day is 24 hours. I'd like you to write that down anyways. I want you guys to start paying attention to the abbreviations that I use for units. So for instance, days and hours. I'd also like to point out that this is one of your first conversion factors that I'll be teaching you as we go along. Uh, in science, a conversion factor relates one set of units, such as days, to another set of units, such as hours. And they can be used to great effect to understand things. We also have Earth's uh, orbital revolution. I guess we could call it the orbital period of Earth. That gives rise to a year which is approximately 365 days. Notice that I can just use little d for days. That's commonly done. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, Earth orbits counterclockwise. Both um, the spin and the orbit are counterclockwise as seen uh, from above or from north. Now, if I can define north as anything in the direction of Earth's North Pole, and if I can define south as uh, anything in the direction of Earth's South Pole, how do I do east and west? Well, here, if you look at the United States in front of you, the east coast where Rhode Island is, is here, and the west coast is there. But if I spin 12 hours, now America isn't looking at my face. Now east is pointing over here to the right. But remembering, of course, that the Earth spins in the direction of the east coast of the United States, remembering also that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west because of the spin of Earth, we can define east in kind of a funny way that only makes sense to astronomers. From now on, counterclockwise in space will be defined as east. The triple equals means it is defined as such, so don't argue about it. By the way, the more you think about this, the more it makes good sense. Earth has a counterclockwise or eastward spin. Of course, this also implies that clockwise is defined now as west. OK, let's do a quick test to see if you guys get it, OK? Uh, let's go to, first of all, let me share my screen with you. OK, let's go to slide 56. 56. OK, 
Does Earth make an eastward or a westward journey around the sun? That'd be eastward. Well, That's we... right. Yeah. Sage, let's ask you another question. Suppose we were on the Earth's perspective, like on an Earth-based reference frame. Does the sun make an eastward or a westward journey against the background stars? Use the diagram I've shown for help. Um, I used to know this off the top of my head. I believe yeah. it's a westward journey. No, it is not. East, west, no. Sorry. Look, <laughs> look at the diagram. In March, the sun is in Pisces. That's like a 12 o'clock hand, right? Now in June, the sun is in Gemini. That's like the nine o'clock position. Now in September, the sun is projected onto Virgo. And now in December, it's, do you see how the sun, let's get my draw tool. The sun is drifting like this relative to the background constellations. Do you see that? that makes sense. Yeah, I was doing my like never eating soggy waffles, trying to figure it out, but <laughs> that makes more sense. But the better things to do was just to look at the picture here, right? Okay, that's all right. It's okay to get a little confused from time to time, but now we can see that not only does Earth make an eastward journey around the sun, but from the, from the Earth's point of view, the sun is also making an eastward journey. Everything seems to be orbiting counterclockwise in space, okay, or eastward. Okay, important lesson. Um, the, the orbit of Earth is, is not quite a perfect circle, but it's damn close to it. And there's an important vocabulary term that we have to describe this, this circular green path, the quasi-circular orbit of Earth. It's known as the ecliptic. Let's see if I can find a, a good picture of the ecliptic here. I kind of like this one here. This one's nice because it shows you the ecliptic path as a dark blue circular arrow. It also shows you the Earth has a kind of axis tilt with respect to the ecliptic plane. The ecliptic plane is this sort of blue surface that you see here. It's a two-dimensional plane made by connecting the ecliptic path to, uh, to the sun. <clears throat> Let's try to define those terms. I'm going to go ahead and erase this stuff. Okay, so we have uh, this new vocabulary term, the ecliptic. And the ecliptic has two definitions. This is definition number one. Simply put, it is the path of Earth around the sun. Nothing fancy about it. If you wanted to, we could define the ecliptic plane as uh, a two-dimensional surface. A two-dimensional surface made by the ecliptic path. Uh, one of the ideas is that if you define the Earth-Sun line as the ecliptic plane, um, this kind of becomes something like the disk of the solar system. The planets, uh, to, to within a very small number of degrees, tend to orbit within the ecliptic plane. As a quick demo, I could go to Mr. Internet here and find the orbital inclinations of the planets. <clears throat> and uh, there's a couple of different ways to define the orbital inclinations, but this crappy little picture sort of shows us here. I don't love this, but it works. Uh, you can see that if you define Earth and Sun to be the ecliptic plane, uh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> Planets like Jupiter and Venus and Mars are maybe one, two, or three degrees above or below the ecliptic plane. Um, notable exceptions, Mercury is seven degrees inclined to the ecliptic plane. So that means it kind of orbits seven degrees. That's a little bit bigger than the average planet. Pluto is extremely uh, inclined, but even then it's only about 17 degrees. Pluto is one of the most extreme uh, orbital inclinations. 
for the most part, the planets are kind of orbiting super, super close to the same orbital path the Earth does. And you know, that's kind of, that's not random. That means something. You know, there is nothing in the laws of gravity that, that would have prevented a planet from orbiting the sun completely perpendicular to the ecliptic plane. The fact that eight planets all happen to be within a few degrees of the ecliptic plane, that tells us that there's a connection between the way the solar system formed. It formed through the nebular, or the nebular theory of a collapsing single disk and it uh, something to do with the conservation of angular momentum. I can get into that later. But, but there's a reason why the planets orbit very close to the ecliptic plane. So we can think of the ecliptic plane as the disk of the solar system. Now, <clears throat> as we just talked about uh, with Sage a moment ago, it's sometimes helpful to think about the solar system from the Earth perspective, because that's where you, the observer, is located. And if you do this, if you try to imagine the ecliptic plane from an Earth-based perspective, we tend to sort of imagine ourselves on Earth with the North Pole facing up and the South Pole facing down. And now the ecliptic path becomes something else. Instead of it being the orbit of Earth around the sun, we can think of it as the orbit that the sun makes over an entire year against the background stars. Now, I want to be careful here. I'm not talking about the sun's daily motion. It's diurnal motion is the sun rises in the east and the sun sets in the west. So during the day, the sun is making a westward journey. But if you look over the course of a year, as we just sort of discussed uh, with Sage, I tricked Sage, that was fun for me, okay? Um, we can see that the sun each day is drifting by approximately one degree or four minutes eastward along the background stars. And we can think of this circle also as the ecliptic. So the ecliptic has two definitions. The first was the path of Earth around the sun. The ecliptic definition number two is the path of the sun against the background stars. Doesn't that remind you guys of something? Oh, by the way, make sure you include yearly paths so you don't get confused. Does the path of the sun against the background stars remind you of something that we talked about earlier? Astrology. Astrology. And that suggests that the ecliptic, the path of the sun against the background stars, should follow the constellations of the zodiac. zodiac. That's right. That's my next point. The ecliptic is the zodiac. If you are a working astronomer, you know where the ecliptic is because when you go out at night, you look up at the sky and you look for constellations like Pisces, Aries, Taurus, Cancer, Gemini, you know that those constellations are located along the ecliptic and that's where you're gonna find planets because that's also the disk of the solar system, right? So this stuff is all kind of connected. It's just about your reference frame. So the ecliptic is the zodiac, the ecliptic is the path of Earth around the sun, the ecliptic is the disk of the solar system, the ecliptic is where you find planets. It's a wicked, useful vocabulary term. Um, it's also important to remember that as Earth spins around, uh, I don't know where that slide is again. As Earth spins around the sun, as it orbits around the sun, it has an axis tilt inclined 23.5 degrees with respect to the ecliptic. And you can see from this picture that Earth kind of maintains the same direction as it's spinning that that ecliptic is always kind of pointed sorry the axis tilt is always kind of pointed in the same direction up towards the star polaris okay so we can take this as a note as well we can say that um earth's axis is tilted by 23.5 degrees with uh, respect 
to the ecliptic plane. That's the 23.5 degree axis tilt of Earth. Uh, as our solar system students know, this gives rise to the seasons. Some people have a mistaken idea that the change in seasons has to do with Earth's changing distance from the sun. And that's actually not true. Um, Earth's distance does change as it orbits the sun by a very microscopic amount, but it is not enough to affect seasons. And that's because the, the squishiness of Earth's orbit is only a mere 2%. Its orbit is super, super close to a perfect circle. We actually have some fancy vocab terms uh, for the point closest to the sun in orbit. We call it the perihelion. And the point farthest from the sun in orbit is called the aphelion. Those are some other good vocabulary terms for us to know about. So I want to slap them down on the board here. Are you guys cool with this stuff? Does anyone need another moment here? All right, I'm erasing. Okay. So last couple of vocab terms, we have perihelion, point closest to the sun in orbit. Not only does Earth have a perihelion, but the other planets do as well. Um, there's an aphelion. Point farthest from the sun in orbit. Of course, as my solar system students know, there is a useful term to define the average distance between the Earth and the Sun is a special measurement known as the astronomical unit. It is defined as the average distance between Earth and the Sun, and it is equivalent to 150,000, I'm sorry, 150 million kilometers. And let's just do a quick review of some distances, okay? So metric units of distance. This is a science course. We're gonna be using metric units. In my hand, I have a meter. A meter is approximately the width of this dry erase board that I'm holding up here. It's kind of like a yard, but better, okay? The meter is our gold standard. The meter is our gold standard for metric units of distance. Um, it's sometimes helpful for us to use kilometers. You guys, uh, one kilometers. One kilometer, one km, is equal to a thousand meters. But you already kind of knew that because you knew that kilo means 10 to the three. If you didn't know that a kilometer was a thousand meters, put a box around that conversion factor because we're gonna be using that all the time. Kilometers are good for measuring the diameters of planets and stars. So uh, good for uh, measuring the radius or of planets and stars. Well, not all stars, but some stars. When we start traveling around the solar system, we're gonna want to use bigger, larger units so that we can more eloquently express distances within our solar system. And that's where an astronomical unit comes in. Okay, so let's define this. An astronomical unit One AU is defined as the average distance between Earth and the sun, okay? It has a value of 150 million kilometers. 
Um, Sage, we have a rule about big numbers in this class, right? What's our rule? Nothing bigger than a million. Okay, so why don't you help me slap that into scientific notation? So I believe that would be 1.5 times 10 to the 12th. Careful. 11. Careful. Oh my God, I'm adding an extra one. Eighth, sorry. <laughs> Say that? Uh, the eighth. Great. Come on. Sorry, right? I was adding an extra guy in there. Now, if you write an AU like this, this is what I call, I don't know if anyone else calls it this, but this is sort of the proper form of scientific notation, right? In proper form of scientific notation, you have a lead digit followed by some numbers after the decimal point, that's the leftover change, and then you multiply times 10 to some power. You'll often notice that the book and other people, when they put numbers into scientific notation, they'll kind of use that proper form with a single lead digit. It's also good to know that we don't have to use proper form. We could write an astronomical unit if we wanted to as 15 times 10 to the seven kilometers. That's a little weird, but it's okay, all right? That's fine. I actually like to slide my decimal point. This is just a matter of personal style. I actually prefer to keep the decimal point slid back two numbers. And the way I like to write an astronomical unit is I like to write it as 150 times 10 to the six kilometers. And this, my friends, right here, this is good uh, math style. I'm always trying to jiggle around my numbers so that my power of 10 looks like a million or a billion or a trillion, because then it will kind of flow off my brain in an elegant way. One AU is equal to 150 million kilometers. So you might see me doing things like that from time to time. I don't want to scare you. There, there's weird kooky reasons why I choose to move a decimal place to a certain point. And usually it just has to do with elegance and memorization. It's easy for me to memorize that one AU is 150 million kilometers. It's more awkward to memorize one AU is 1.5 hundred thousand kilometers, okay? But they mean the same thing. All right. Um, <clears throat> From time to time, well, okay, let's take a look at the astronomical unit in, in practice. It's really useful for measuring distances between the sun and the planets. For instance, you'll notice that Mercury is about 40% of an AU uh, from the sun, and Venus is about 70% of an AU. Um, Earth is one AU by definition. Mars is 1.5 AU from the sun. In the outer solar system, distances become more epic. Jupiter is 5 AU from the sun. Saturn is 10 AU from the sun. So, woo, sorry. Uh, Saturn is twice the distance from the sun that Jupiter is. Uranus is about 20 AU. Neptune is about 30 AU. You'll notice in this diagram that the orbit of Pluto is, is very eccentric. It actually is so squished that it comes interior to the orbit of Neptune from time to time. This is yet another reason that Pluto kind of acts more like a comet than a planet. But anyways, if you take the average distance of Pluto, the average distance of Pluto from the sun is 40 astronomical units. I'm not sure why I keep jumping like that, but something weird is going on. Okay, um, notice from slide, what was that, seven? Here's a logarithmic scale showing the solar system in astronomical units. One other thing that's cool about AU is that the diameter of the radius of the solar system is about 100 astronomical units. So any time you want to measure distances from one point to the next in the solar system, it's usually a number between 1 and 100, which is easier to remember. So astronomical units are great for solar system scale distances. By the time you get out to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, you're starting to get up there in the hundreds of thousands of astronomical units. And at that point, AUs are not really appropriate for measuring distances between the stars. Of course, this is a class where we want to leave the solar system and travel between the stars. So unlike your 1010 course, we're going to spend a little more time thinking about a larger unit called the light year. Okay. This will also come up in our homework.
instead of the AU, let's consider the light year. The light year is abbreviated 1LY. It is defined as the distance light travels in one year. And I think astronomers chose light because light is the fastest thing that can, can move in physics. In physics, the absolute top speed allowable in nature is the speed of light. And the speed of light, which will come up in this class C, has a value of roughly 300,000 kilometers per second. That's the speed of light. It travels 300,000 kilometers per second. Um, <clears throat> if you multiply the speed of light by the number of seconds in a year, we can do that at a later time, you discover that one light year is roughly equal to 9.5 trillion kilometers. Uh, please be careful. Sometimes people get a little bamboozled by the fact that the term year isn't there. They start thinking it's a unit of time. A light year is a unit of distance. It's a unit of distance, okay? It's equal to 9.5 trillion kilometers. For instance, for example, gratius, um, the distance to uh, Alpha Centauri, the closest star to the sun is 4.4 light years. All right. <clears throat> from time to time, it's necessary for us to convert from one set of units like light years to another set of units like astronomical units or kilometers. And when those things come up, as they are going to do in this class, there's a technique that I want us to all use. Even if you're as good as Sage and you're a math major who has skills, I'd prefer that we all use a, a certain methodology or a technique called dimensional analysis. I want to list the steps of it in an easy to memorize method. And then I want us to try a problem using this technique. And if you could all kind of get on board with me, I'd appreciate that. So um, introducing, um, <clears throat> uh, can I erase this guys? Okay. So let's talk about um, dimensional analysis. Consider this your second major lesson of the day, okay? Dimensional analysis is going to be uh, how we solve problems in this class. And in particular, it's particularly useful for conversion problems. Uh, that's where we have to convert one set of units to another units. Actually, there are multiple levels of dimensional analysis that I will eventually teach you. Dimensional analysis is actually a deep rabbit hole that is way more profound than simply converting units. One of my first tasks as an undergraduate physics student, I mean, I can't believe, I was 18 years old. They asked us, one of our first homework assignments was to derive the Planck length, knowing nothing about physics, the smallest length allowable in the universe using only the technique of dimensional analysis. That problem blew my mind. And if you want, someday I'll share that problem with you. It'll, it'll really mess you up. So there's, there's a lot of intensity here that, that's, not going, that's not immediately recognizable. Let's start with the most basic form of dimensional analysis. The form is where we have to convert one set of units like, uh, I want to convert something like some number of astronomical units into some number of kilometers. This is where the basic version of dimensional analysis is really useful. So um, what we have are four steps of dimensional analysis. And I want you guys to sort of write these down with me here. All right. In step one, you are going to write down the number to convert with 
its units, okay? That's your first step. And just write these down with me because it's kind of important. Write down the number to convert with its units. In the second step, you are going to multiply by a division bar, okay? Um, in our third step, which is the key step of dimensional analysis, we are going to put the units in first such that they cancel each other out. So put the units in first to cancel out. And then in the fourth step, we will put the numbers in second, the numbers in second using our pre-discovered conversion factors. I want you to write down these four steps of dimensional analysis just like this. If I had to sum up dimensional analysis in a single phrase, it would be units first, numbers second. That's how I think about it. All right. Uh, some of you, uh, I'm, I did that rather quickly because I know Ryan and Ian know the drill. I make a big deal out of this. It's one of the most useful things I teach my students. Sage, you're the only non-troll that hasn't taken my course before. So math major or not, you're going to do this with me just to make sure that you can conform to my styles, okay? So let's come up with a basic, simple, wicked simple problem. Let's solve it with dimensional analysis. Then maybe I'll give you a slightly more complicated one. And then I'll show you how you can use this to great effect, all right? Okay, so let's say we have uh, the kind of problem that dimensional analysis is great for. If Pluto is, and I'm doing a real easy one because I want to go soft on any of those students at first who haven't had a lot of exposure to math. If Pluto is 40 AU uh, on average from the sun, how many kilometers is that? Now, Sage might be good enough to kind of solve that in his head without dimensional analysis, but I think it would be fun Harrison Bergeron style to slow him down in the science fiction story, Harrison Bergeron, they, they take the most intelligent man in the room and they put a buzzer in his ear so that he's constantly ringing and he can't think straight. That equalizes his intelligence to the rest of uh, the classroom here. So you got to read this Harrison Bergeron if you haven't. Now I'm Harrison Bergeron style, going to slow Sage's thinking down and I'm going to force him to conform to the state society here. And he's going to use the four steps of dimensional analysis to solve this basic problem. Okay. Our first step, Sage, is to write down the number to convert with its units. So what number should I write down and what units? So that's gonna be AU to kilometer. Wait, we wanna write down the number. What's our number? The number to convert is 40 AU. That's what I wanna hear, okay. Okay, I'm sorry. That's all right. It would be easier in Latin with the agreement <laughs> terms. Um, well, <laughs> It's just, I, I need you guys to understand what I mean by these steps, okay, so. No, yeah, I just, uh, it was ambiguous to what it took me a second. Fine. Um, I could pull out my Wheelock's Latin here, if you really want, uh, if you really want to go there, right? <laughs> I took four semesters of it. Um, anyways, okay. I took three years. <laughs> oh, really? It's, um. I did it in high school for three years. No kidding, no kidding. I still am not that good at it. I, uh, it's but it's, really a, it's, a, it's classy to learn the classics, you know? I was in the history and the culture, not the language. Yeah. yeah. It's cool to be forced to read like Cicero's essay on friendship or something like that. There's some deep yeah. wisdom in the ancient world. Get me really it's interested. It's really cool. Um, um, let's go to second step. Multiply by a division bar. Now, here's what I mean by this. Every time we multiply, Every conversion problem either involves multiplication or division. 
Sometimes it's not always easy to see what to do, especially when the units become a little bit more abstract. So we're gonna keep our options open. We're gonna multiply by a division bar just like this. Now for the students who are not so good at math, every number is part of a secret fraction. You're either on the top of the fraction or the bottom of the fraction. Notice that 40 AU looks like it's in the middle of the line, but actually, if we remember our maths, you can always divide a number by one without changing it. And that means that every number is part of a secret fraction where if you're not explicitly in the denominator, you are technically in the numerator of a fraction. And that means that the AUs uh, that we see here, they're actually on the top of that fraction. We're gonna use this in step three. We're gonna put in units so that we can cancel out our astronomical units and we can end up with kilometers. Since AUs are on the top, we will put AUs at the bottom. Now AUs on the top, which cancel out which with AUs at the bottom, okay? And we wanna convert from AUs into kilometers, so they're gonna go on the top. And that's step three. We haven't used any numbers, we've just put the units in first here to cancel out. In step four, we're gonna put the numbers in second using conversion factors, top and bottom. Now to do step four, that requires that somewhere along the line, I would have given you a conversion factor between kilometers and AU. And I think I did that, didn't I? What was your conversion factor? Just look at um, 150,000, uh, 150 million kilometers is- uh, One AU, right? One AU, yeah. So, so earlier we learned that one AU is 150 million kilometers. So you have to have that tucked in your back pocket somewhere, okay? Now let's go ahead and let Sage put the numbers in second. Sage, you got to give me a number on top and a number on bottom. What do you want to do? Um, so we can put uh, 150 times 10 to the 60th on top and one on the bottom. That's right. Not 60th, but sixth. Or, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. So I want to point out something that Sage did correctly there. He's making sure that he keeps the number next to the unit in which it appears in the conversion factor. So the 150 million stays next to the kilometers. That one stays next to the AU. That's important. Okay. Now at the end, you just kind of do whatever the math problem tells you to do. We multiply 40 times 150 million divided by one. Let's practice using our EXP key together. So punch after me, do this in memory of me, okay? We're just gonna do uh, 40 times 150. Uh, we just hit EXP for times 10 to the six and equals and boom, there's our answer. Okay, um, we should decide how to write this down. Is this bigger than a million? Yeah. Okay. So let's put it into scientific notation, Ian. Uh, if I read that correctly, it's six times 10 to the ninth. So uh, six billion. Yeah. And the units? Um, it's going to be kilometers. And then we put a box around it because that's a classy move. Okay. That's six billion kilometers to Pluto. Now, this is a very basic problem, but what I'm showing you guys, let's clean this up again. I'm showing you the way that we are gonna be doing business in this class. That's how I wanna see our homework problems done and I'll be training you to do this. Um, I could try to figure out the number of astronomical units to Alpha Centauri, but I think I have a better idea related to one of your homework problems. Dimensional analysis is a powerful technique that makes problems that were formerly confusing and hard to understand clear and easy. And there's a number of fun games you can play with it. One that I like to think about all the time is a little game called, do you have what it takes to teach art? Okay. <laughs> and uh, in, this, in this game, I like to imagine that I was an art teacher for a bunch of elementary school kids and I'm gonna take a beach ball 
And I'm going to ask these elementary school kids to make a scale model of the solar system. So what we'll do is we'll get a beach ball and we'll make like a paper mache sun. We'll take like a, a beach ball, we'll cover it with chicken wire, and then we'll cover the chicken wire with, uh, you know, the newspaper and the goo. And then when it dries up, we'll paint it with fiery sun colors. And let's say we wanted to make the beach. This is this. I don't have a beach ball, but this is about the size of a beach ball, I think. And if we were to do this in metric units, um, let's do this in centimeters here. Centimeters are hundredths of a meter. It looks to me like the diameter of this beach ball is about, um, well, maybe close to 30 centimeters or so, right? Can you guys see that? I actually think it's a little bigger. When I when I do it here, oh. yeah, if I put it through here, it actually goes past 30 centimeters and I can't get right to the middle. I think it's actually a lot closer to 40 centimeters. Now, once I have the students make a paper mache sun, which is 40 centimeters in diameter, I then what I want to do is I want to take a bunch of little marbles and an other size ping pong balls of various sizes. And I want them to calculate the distance to all of those planets to scale with the beach ball sun. So if the sun were 40 centimeters in diameter, how far away would I have to go to place marble Earth? How far away would I have to go to place tennis ball Jupiter? How far away would I have to go to place BB-sized Pluto, okay? And see if they can work out a scale model. This is a perfect uh, technique to use dimensional analysis for. Or dimensional analysis is the perfect technique to solve this problem with. Oops. And this is related to one of our homeworks about scale models. So let's try that. Let's talk about building uh, a scale model of, at first we'll start with the solar system, but then we'll go beyond. Okay. The idea behind building a scale model is that you are going to create the conversion factor that you need to do the job. So we're gonna start with the sun. The true diameter of the sun is 1.4 million kilometers. And I want you to remember that that's going to come up uh, in our homeworks here. The sun's diameter is 1.4 million kilometers. Um, if I build a model in which it's the size of a beach ball, I'm going to be setting it equal to 40 centimeters. By the way, I meant to put this in our metric units of distance, but in case students out there don't know, one meter contains 100 centimeters. That's a good, uh, that's a good conversion factor. Now, oftentimes in our labs, we use meter sticks, and you can see they, they've got 100 of these. Oof, this is a little dirty now, but they got 100 centimeters. A centimeter is about the width of your is about the width of your pinky fingernail. That's how I would think about a centimeter. Okay. Okay. How far away would I have to go in my scale model to place a little BB Earth? You guys know that Earth is one AU away from the sun. The idea behind a scale model is that you create your own conversion factors based on fun, okay? So what I've done is I've created a scale factor in which 1.4 million kilometers is equal to 40 centimeters. But I'm gonna show you guys a little useful trick here. Because there are 100 centimeters in a meter, because there are 1,000 meters in a kilometer, there is an actual number of centimeters that represents the diameter of the sun. And I got a feeling that it ain't 40. You know what I'm saying? 
we have to make sure that we can keep our brain straight between the real diameter of the sun and the paper mache fake diameter of the sun. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a little prime next to the centimeters. You'll find this is a helpful thing to do where the prime represents the sort of paper mache scale model, okay? So the prime represents, sometimes I just refer to it as fake centimeters or paper mache centimeters, all right? That can be useful so that you don't get the two confused. Okay, let's use dimensional analysis and let's figure out the question, how far away in say fake centimeters, how far away do I need to be to have the students move away from the sun to place the marble earth? So how far from the uh, paper, C-H-I, how do you spell paper mache? M-A, can I spell paper mache? Maybe M-A-C-H-E-T. -E? No, no, no. Or E T. Paper, paper meh. I thought there was an I in there. No, it's paper M-A-C-H-E. What? That's I-E-R? Why did all these people on the internet? No, not unless you're talking some French stuff. So we got comments from the peanut gallery here. Look just, at the Wikipedia page. Technically it's P-A-P-I-E-R. That's where the I is. P-A-P-I-E-R-M-A-C-H-E -E with a accente. Huh. You learn something new every day. The real takeaway from this class is how to spell paper mache. Yeah, I think so. With the that, I don't know if that's accente grave or accente gu. How far from the paper mache sun do I, do the students place earth? Okay. Um, this is a problem we didn't do in 1010. So anyone, Ian, Ryan, Sage, I don't care who, how should I go about doing this? Well, I'm trying to think through it for myself. because Don't this was think. Weird. No one gave you permission to think. <laughs> All I gave you permission to do is dimensional analysis. You do not have to think with dimensional analysis. That's what's cool about it. You follow the rules of a good little soldier, okay? Be a good child soldier. And what are the rules? Start, start with rule number one. Um, well, we need to find the number to convert. All right. So what's the number we're trying to convert with its units? That's what I was trying to think about. So I'm, I, we're trying to convert one AU, right? Essentially, right? Okay. So let's write that down. What's step two? Um, multiply by a division bar. What's step division three? Uh, put in the units. Okay. So give me some units. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we would go to kilometers first. So okay. AU on the bottom, kilometers on the top, and then you would put one AU on the bottom and then 150 million on the top. Okay. This converts from A to kilometers. Now, frequently what happens if one step is not enough to get you where you want to go, you have to go from step three or step four back to step two and make another division bar. So far, we know that we have to go 150 kilometers away, but that doesn't tell us anything about our paper mache world. So we're going to have to go back to step two and we're going to have to make another division bar. Now, what do I do? Uh, kilometers on the bottom and fake centimeters on the top, I guess. Excellent. Okay, and now help me put in my conversion factor. Um, 1.4 million uh, kilometers on the bottom and then 40 centimeters on the top. Because I'm using this scale factor, the conversion factor that I invented. Okay, why don't you guys see if you can punch all that up for me using your calculators. Tell me what you get. In fact, since this is the first day, since some of the studio people at home are watching, I want you to watch me do it. I'm gonna multiply, 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 divide. I'm skipping all the ones really. So I'm actually just gonna skip one AU. I'm gonna do 150 EXP6 times 40 divided by 1.4 EXP6 equals. What do you got? 
I got, um, well, sorry, uh, you want me to, actually, no, we don't need to, uh, 4,285. All right, now that's a lot of precision here. Yeah. What I'm going to suggest we get in the habit of, we're going to talk about rounding in a little bit during our, our lab session, but only a math student would write down 4285.714286 as, as if there was all this precision involved in measurement. We're just going to kind of crudely round this from 4285. We're going to round it to 4300. And what are the units? 4,000. Um, the units would be fake centimeters. Fake centimeters, that's right. OK, so in some ways, this is our answer. But let's get real, guys. If you start telling these sixth graders, you need to place marble earth 4,300 centimeters away from your paper mache sun, they're going to be like, what? What are you talking about, teacher? I don't understand that. So also how, why don't we convert this to some other unit? Like, what would be a better unit to use? Meters. Yeah. OK, and Ryan, how would I convert that into meters? Show the students at home how to use dimensional analysis. Um, you would put, I mean, to be honest, you don't really need dimensional analysis for this, but you would put. Let's assume that we do, because. 4,300 centimeters. Fake centimeters. And, fake centimeters, sorry. Times the division bar. Put centimeters on top. Whoa, 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 whoa. Centimeters are already on top, right? Oh, no. Yeah, centimeters on bottom and meters on top, sorry. Right. And even though they're fake centimeters and fake meters, they're paper mache, the conversion factor is still the same. So how many centimeters are in a meter? 100 centimeters for one meter. Right. And so if we divide this by 100, our students would have to travel 43 meters from the sun. That's actually kind of a considerable distance. Um, my apartment, I don't actually know how many feet long it is, but my apartment is two meters. It can't be, my apartment is probably 20 meters or less, uh, maybe even 15 to 20 meters in length. 43 meters. Well, how long is a football field in meters? I guess an American football field. Three hundred and sixty feet. Great. Three sixty feet to meters. Okay, it's about a hundred meters is the length of a typical football field, right? So that's close to half a football field. It's not quite there. I don't know. I'm just trying to think of something that people can relate to. Personally, I I don't really relate to sports. Sorry, I was picturing children like running down the football field. I was like, run, go. Hey, yeah, exactly. Okay. And that's just Earth. So <laughs> right. So now what if we wanted to take them to Pluto? You're gonna be in the next town over. <laughs> Maybe. Well, let's work it out. So uh, we know. In a way, guys, we've kind of created a new conversion factor. We now know that one AU is equal to about 43 fake meters. And so that's now also related to our scale factor. It's another conversion factor that we accidentally came up with. OK? So I'm going somewhere with this, so just humor me. I'm almost done here. So now we'll say how far to Pluto on this scale. There's a bunch of different ways to do this, but what would you guys say the quickest way to do it is? Uh, what did, how many AU um, Pluto is? And then just so we know that from our previous problem. How many AU is it to, to Pluto? 40. 40. Yeah, right, right. So if it's 40 AU to Pluto, let's use dimensional analysis. What should we use for our conversion factor? Uh, the conversion factor we just came up with. So AU on the bottom and the fake meters on top. And we'll put 43 on top and one on the bottom. 
Yeah. It's 43 meters off uh, paper mache meters to one AU. So how many, how many meters would that be then? One uh, thousand seven hundred twenty. So let's just call it seventeen hundred fake meters. How many kilometers is that? One point seven. Yeah. The students would have to go almost two kilometers to place a small little BB next to that beach ball or uh, for, to place a little Pluto BB away from that beach ball. I don't know about two kilometers, but uh, let's see here, two kilometers to miles. So it's, it's 1.2 miles, I don't know. We're all in different places, so it's hard to come up with a good analogy. I'd say that's from CCRI to the stop and shop parking lot or something like that, you know? Far enough to start renting Barbie Jeeps. <laughs> say that again, Sage. Far enough to start renting Barbie Jeeps for them. Yeah. <laughs> so what about Sage if I wanted to take them to Alpha Centauri? What if I wanted to, by the way, you know what weird thing? Alpha Centauri, the closest star to us, has almost exactly the same diameter and other characteristics as our sun. The closest star to us is wicked similar to our own sun. So how far would it, so we could have them make another paper mache beach ball 40 centimeters away. How far would they have to go to get to Alpha Centauri? How many AU away is Alpha Centauri? We didn't work that out before. I gave you another unit though. Yeah, um, what you gave us is Alpha Centauri is 4.4 .4 light years away and I one light. I guess we'll have to start with that as the unit, okay? Yeah. All right, so uh, Ian, since you're experienced in my methods, let's figure this out. Help, help me hop and skip and jump to some paper mache unit. Yeah, um, well, it's probably gonna be multiple division bars here. Yeah, I think so. so. The first one, I know that you gave us uh, one light year into kilometers. So well, let's do that. Light year on the bottom and kilometers on the top. Do you, uh, we can put the conversion factors in later, I guess. Then where should we go? And then um, kilometers on the bottom of the next one and AU on top. Uh, hold on. Right. We want to go to AU or don't we have a conversion from, well, yeah, okay. We could, you have two options here. You can go from kilometers to AU and AU to fake meters, or we could do kilometers to fake centimeters. I don't know. I guess, I guess AU is fine if you want to do it that way. And then what? Um, and then AU to uh, fake centimeters, I guess, because no. we can do meters. You have it's AU to fake meters. meters. Yeah. Yeah. And now kilometers will cancel out and AUs will cancel out. Okay. So give us our conversion factors now. Um, one light year to 9.5 billion or trillion kilometers. Billion. Yep. And then um, 150 million kilometers to one AU. Okay. And then 43 fake meters to so one AU. Okay, why don't you guys punch that in and tell me what you get? I want to make sure you get the same thing I do. Once again, it's the first day, so I should probably punch along for those students who have trouble. Uh, I need to show me and the problem at the same time. Okay. So I'll do 4.4 uh, and I'll do times 9.5 EXP 12 um, times one divided by, I'm gonna divide by 150 EXP six times 43. I don't have to divide by one. Huh. 
Is that what you got? So what is that? How should we express that? 11 times 10 to the 6 fake meters. Well, look, you've got 11.9, so let's call it 12, okay? Okay. That's 12 million fake meters. How many kilometers would that be? Fake kilometers. What's the conversion factor? Come on, guys. Meters to kilometers. Don't make me fall asleep here. Would it be 0.119? Wait, uh, come on. Can you give me the conversion factor for a Sage? Several oh, yeah, for sure. It's um, 1,000 meters in every kilometer. Okay, so how many fake kilometers is that? So 0.12 or 0 0.012. And so huh? uh, <laughs> just punch it 12, in your calculator. Don't be a hero. Times 10 to the third. 12 times 10 to the third, which can also be expressed as 12,000 fake kilometers. Yeah. Sorry, I was trying to keep it in 10 to the sixth for. Well, that's fine. But remember, under a million, it's actually more elegant to say 12,000. Don't you agree? Yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't know now, here's something to think about. The radius of Earth is 6,000 kilometers. The diameter of Earth is 12,000 kilometers. So if we wanted our students to make a scale model between the Sun and Alpha Centauri, they would need to put one paper mache beach ball in Rhode Island, and then we'd have to send the kids to the other side of Earth, somewhere in Sumatra, in Indonesia, and we'd have to have another beach ball in Jakarta, in Indonesia. So that's how far apart those two beach balls would need to be. Two beach balls separated by the diameter of Earth. That's how far away to scale Alpha Centauri, the closest star is to the sun. Now, here's a thought. Do you think the sun, as it drifts around the galaxy, will ever run a risk of crashing into Alpha Centauri? Probably not. <laughs> because the diameter of those two stars, the, the beach ball diameter, is a microscopic fraction of the distance between them, the mm -hmm. diameter of Earth, right? And for this reason, stars never collide with each other because their diameters are a pitiful fraction of their separation distances. Now, here's something weird about astronomy that, that only astronomers know. On larger scales, on galactic scales, this is not true. Galaxies are separated by much greater distances, literally millions of light years. But galaxy diameters are a significant fraction of their separation distances. For this reason, although I cannot show you any pictures of colliding stars, I can show you cool pictures like Stefan's Quintet. Uh, this is a legendary image showing a pair of colliding spiral galaxies. Stars don't collide, but the galaxies do. And in this image here, you can see two spiral galaxies like the Milky Way in a gravitational collision in which all of their stars are swirling around and being mixed together. What's pretty preposterous about galaxy collisions is even though the galaxies collide, the stars which make up the galaxies do not collide. And they rather swarm around each other like a ball of gnats. In fact, we, the Milky Way, our galaxy is moving towards the Andromeda galaxy on a sort of collision course that'll probably take place in five to 10 giga years. So maybe five or 10 billion years. Our galaxy and the Milky Way will merge. This kind of thing happens all the time. 
One of my former professors actually made a simulation for this, which I, I could share with you guys really quick. I, I was, think, pardon me? All right, I think when I was uh, like a, a, a bit younger, um, I was watching like Nova or something and they, they, they had like a whole simulation of like what that would look like. Yeah, in fact, this former professor of mine, he, he kind of was one of the original people that did this stuff. So um, this is not just an, uh, a little movie made with a crayon. This is an actual simulation where uh, they took a supercomputer and they, they actually made a rotating galaxy. Of course, the computers can't handle a trillion point particles, but they'll take like a, like a million point particles, which is still cool. So here at the beginning, and this is all iterating in giga years up at the top, we can see, uh, by the way, so this is the Milky Way galaxy here. Ooh, this is kind of hard on my processor. I wanna just back up for a second. So in this simulation, we see the Milky Way galaxy and the red dot that you see here is the sun. And he's actually using Newtonian gravity to model the rotations of this. So this is the real orbit of the sun around the galactic center. And we're going to zoom out and we're going to watch the collision between the sun and Andromeda. So let's do that. Kind of interesting. Now, he's also going to be changing the frame and the perspective. So here's the zoom out and here comes Andromeda. And we're going to be rotating angles as they get closer. That allows us to see the interaction between them. So here come the galaxies sizing each other up. And watch the moment they collide, what happens to all the stars. Because the stars are not collisional, they kind of merge with each other, boop, and they create these beautiful long tails. As some stars are ejected from the system, notice what's going to happen to the orbit of our own sun. It's going to go into a highly eccentric ellipse, but the sun will not crash into any other stars because the stars are separated by too great a distance relative to their diameters. So galaxies actually merge. And if you noticed the moment when those two galaxies collided, remember when you could see those, uh, those tails ejecting from them? Where, right, where, whoop. Come on. Oh, right here. Ooh, it was just a moment before, oh, there it is. Yeah. See those long tails being ejected to each other? Now compare that with the image that you see there of, of Stefan's quartet. Can you see those long tails spilling out? That's exactly what just happened to those two galaxies. Another beautiful example, of course, is the antennae galaxies. We see these kinds of collisions all the time in space. Here's another picture of two spirals. You can see this is shortly after the moment in which, which they've collided with each other. Uh, I should close VLC. That really, that really. So you can see these two galaxies have merged, and you see those two tails ejecting each other. Some of the stars will kind of swirl together. Some of the gas and stars get ejected from the system. The moral of the story is understanding dimensional analysis can actually help you figure out scale models and analogies to realize something cool about nature. Galaxies collide, but the stars inside them do not. And we'll see other cool ways to use dimensional analysis going forward. Now, I had a bunch of other things to do with you guys. I didn't get to them, whatever. We're going to figure out and we'll crash course our way through the homework next class. Um, are you guys willing? So let's start. We're going to do a lab in just a few moments. And we'll keep it short and sweet because you guys are trained pretty well. But uh, before we do our lab, let me ask about the homework that we're going to do on Thursday. We should do the homework together. There's a bunch of tricky bits like this that you're going to want some advice from me from. Are you guys, now I already have a recording of this homework and I could just, you know, drop it on you. But I'm willing to do it live if that's something that you guys want to do. Who's going to show up if I wake up and get, get it together for 10 o'clock? You guys will? Ian? Uh, I'll show up. Okay. I, I have a hard oh, time with more than but oh, I'll wait, who's in, the, who's in the troll factory there? Who else wants to show uh, up? Brandon. All right, Brandon. Show up, yeah. Brandon, you'll be there. Okay. So we got Brandon, we got Sage, we got Ryan. I guess Ryan Dick will be there as well. Okay, so that's, that's, enough, for me to, that's enough for me to do it, okay? Um, remember, if, it, if it's too few people, like, it might be worth it if there's too few people just to give you the pre-recording. But let's kind of set the pace for this. I know that many of you do enjoy these live sessions, so... 
Uh, sometime a little after 10 o'clock, somewhere between 10 and 10.15, I'll send out the link. We'll crank out the homework on Thursday, and then we'll do the lecture, and then we'll do the lab. It's going to be kind of brutal. Now, it's time for our lab component to this course. I'm going to shorten it a bit just to keep the essentials. I'm going to keep it to under an hour. Um, I'm going to just take a quick pause here. We should probably print out our labs. That's what I'm going to do. Um, you could write this down if you don't have a... Uh, if you don't have a printer, you can write the questions out today. Uh, or you could try to do it digitally if you have the skills to do that. But when we type things up, let me just say something right now. Um, here's a copy of Microsoft Word. You are not allowed to give me bullshit like this, like to the power of 12 kilometers. I don't want to see math that looks like that. If you're typing stuff up, I'm going to take off points if you because it's very hard to do that. If you're going to do the math thing, it's up to you to kind of use an equation editor like this. With an equation editor, you can make the math that you do in your uh, uh, assignment look very much like the math that we do in the board. So you've got to get the little time symbol, which is up here. And then we can use a little script. Look at this. This is actually kind of fun. So 10 to the power of 12. That's what... I want to see things looking like on your homeworks. Do you understand? If you cannot handle using an equation editor to make your typed math look like my written math, then you cannot handle typing up your work. And you are obligated to write it out by hand and take a picture. Most of you are just going to want to write this out. So um, what I'm going to do here is I, I didn't, I forgot to print out the lab. So I'm going to take a minute. Um, all we're really going to need, I think, where's that lab? I think all we're going to have time for is just the first page. We're just going to do a quick little exercise together. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit print. And I'm just going to hit uh, page one. You guys can do the same thing. All right. And uh, I'm going to pause the recording for a second. That'll take a minute to print. I'm going to bring my computer over to the little lab station and then we'll get to it, okay? So just give me uh, two or three minutes to bring my computer over to the lab station. Yeah, I am. Okay, students, welcome to the lab portion of this class. Uh, I expect it to be uh, a little shorter than your average lab. We're just gonna do a single page. Honestly, it's the first day and I just wanna practice and make sure that y'all can handle punching stuff into your Casio calculator and that you can do some basic dimensional analysis stuff. Now, what's a little weird here is I know Ryan and I know Ian are well trained in this because they've taken astronomy 1010 and I know they've got the chops. Additionally, Sage is a math major and so this is probably gonna be child's play to him too. So I might kind of move quick because the only people that are sharing video with me are people who know what the hell they're doing. Um, luckily, if you're watching the video at home, I guess you could always pause it. <laughs> and if not, you better send me an email or something if, if I go too fast for you. Often how fast I go kind of depends upon who I'm working with, you know. Um, <clears throat> first thing I want to do is I want to hide the trolls here. All right, there we go. All right, I, I also like to use uh, this phone here as a kind of remote camera. I hope it's charged for bloody sakes here. I could use my iPhone, but then people are going to be sending me embarrassing text messages during the course of the thing. <laughs> That's happened before. It didn't always go so well. Uh, can I get away with that? I guess I could go to airplane mode, right? Yeah, what the hell? If I go to airplane mode, I think. All right, let's try it with my fancy new phone. And uh, please forgive me. Hopefully, everything that pops up in my phone during the course of this uh, lecture will be PG-13, if you know what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> I've definitely had a couple of mishaps that that gave me pause. <laughs> COVID life. Okay, so um, <clears throat> here we go. I'm going to try sharing my screen to my iPhone. Oh, uh, wait, I got to put the Wi-Fi on here. Hopefully I can do this and 
in airplane mode. Okay, share screen. And then uh, here, screen mirroring. There we go. This should connect. Fingers crossed. All right. And now I can go to my camera tool and uh, sure enough, you guys can see my paper. Okay. So you guys have all this in front of you? You have this lab in front of you? Okay. So uh, just rules of thumb. Let's start with our name. Okay. So put your name down. Uh, every time that you uh, write me a email or you submit an assignment, I would like you guys to always put AS1020 uh, on it. Since you're in the summer section, you don't have to worry about your section. Just write AS1020 and I'll know who you are, okay? And then this, of course, is lab one. It's a really good idea to write the, the number of the lab so you know how to submit it later on. So please put that all at the top. Okay, now here you guys can see just a number of basic uh, math problems using scientific notation. The name of the game, I don't, I know there's a way to do this like in your head. That's the way they suggested it up here. But we don't want to do it that way. We just want to practice using that good old fashioned EXP key, which means times 10. So let me show you how I want you to do this. Oh, by the way, we're going to put our answers in proper form of scientific notation just this once. All answers in proper form, even if they're small. Um, I'm going to talk about rounding as a separate discussion in just a minute or two. So here we've got to multiply 2.0 by 2.8 times 10 to the 5. Remember, every time we see that times 10, we're just going to hit the, the good old fashioned EXP key. OK, so uh, let's get to it here. We have 2.0 times 2.8. And then when you see the times 10, you do EXP and then 5 and then equals. All right, so that's our answer, but we have to put it into scientific notation. Ryan, how should I put that into scientific notation for my answer? Uh, that would be 5.6 times 10 to the sixth. Right, there we go with the text messages. Uh, 5.6 times 10 to the what? Six. Come on, did you count that right, buddy? No, 10 to the fifth, sorry. Right, because the decimal, yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, and then we can put a box around it because that's a classy move. That's all I want us to do. All right, in the next problem, we see something that's raised to a negative power. Okay, fine. I didn't address this in lecture because I was sort of running out of time. Uh, do I have a little, hold on, guys, I got a little notepad somewhere. Okay, so let's talk about negative powers for a second. Sometimes you have small numbers which are really annoying to look at like 0 0.000234. That's a little bit annoying to write down on your page. We can do small numbers by making use of negative powers of 10. So let's remember that when you raise 10 to the power of negative one, well, that's the same as one over 10 to the one, and that's what we would call a 10. And in a similar fashion, 10 to the minus two is one over 10 squared, okay, that's 1 over 100, and that's a hundredth. And pretty soon you start to realize that every time you raise 10 to another negative power, you're kind of putting the 1 at the third decimal place. That's what it means. You have a number less than 1, right? Okay, so um, what would you say the lead digit is in this number here? Two. two. So then, Ian, we could express this number as two, and we'll keep the 34 cents as change times 10 to what negative power? Uh, negative fourth. Yeah, because it's one, two, three, four away to get to that thing. So 
sorry, 2.34 times 10 to the minus 4, right? That's how we would write that number. Um, when we put in negatives on the Casio, do not use the minus sign, but we instead use the negative key right here. So that number would go in as 2.34 EXP negative 4. All right, I just left it that way. With that in mind, let's do our next problem, okay? We have five, sorry, <clears throat> bear with me. I'll go as quick as I can. 5.6 times 6.725. And here we're going to do EXP negative key six equals. All right, how do we write this? You could write it as 3.8 times 10 to the negative fifth. All right, so, so Ian's doing a little rounding thing there. He's saying, I probably only need the first two digits. If you cut here, if the number is five or above, we increment this one. So he, that's fine. I'm okay with that. 3.8 times 10 to the minus five. In fact, that's probably a good thing to do. Okay. And let's just keep going with the next ones in the same way. So uh, in the next one, we have 3.77. Uh, EXP5 times 4.8 EXP3. Okay. Uh, so uh, just to talk to someone in the background, was there someone named Brandon in the background? Are you hearing me, Brandon? Yes, I can hear you. Brandon, can you help me put that number to scientific notation? I'm going to try my best. Just give it a whack. That's the idea. So you have to kind of practice here. What's your lead digit? It would be 18, right? Uh, lead digits can't be 18. They have to be oh. 1 through 9. The lead digit's just the or first one, 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 um It's 1, right? 1 point something. Yeah. So what do you want to leave for the something? Uh, 1.8. Okay, I like that. Times 10 to what power? Um, now you got to count, right? You got to count from here to where the eight. decimal. Count better. Hold on. Brandon? Is it is it nine? Yeah. Uh, by the way, I, I can't see you. Do you have a Casio with you? Uh, I do not. I'm, I'm getting it tonight. <clears throat> All right. Make sure you get that tonight. You can see that it kind of helps here to have this to yes. play along with, right? Okay. So correct. It's 1.8 times 10 to the nine. Okay. It's all right, Brandon. We're just trying to figure out where everyone's at here. All right, let's crank out the next one. So we have 5.29 EXP5 times 6.8 EXP negative 7. Wait, isn't it EXP3 for the first one? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm holding and I'm looking. Uh, thank you. 5.29 EXP3 times 6.8 EXP negative 7. Thank you. So it looks like we're going to have what? What do I write down? Uh, you could write down 3.6 times 10 to the negative third. I like it. OK. Now, uh, let's keep going here with division, OK? So we have uh, 9.65 EXP3 divided by 2.0. How do I put that into scientific notation? I don't think you would have to. You could just write that as 4,800. If this was the homework, yes. But just for today's exercise, we'll put everything in scientific notation. OK. So if you rounded it, it could be 5 times 10 to the third. Let's let's get the students in the habit of doing two sig figs for now, Ian. Okay, sure. 4.8. Uh, what you said was actually fine, but I'm going to do 4.8, okay? 
to the third, right? I five times ten to the third would have been cool too. Okay. So five point six exp five divided by one point six exp five. Huh. How do I put three point five into scientific notation? Would you just put, I mean, if you had to put it in scientific no notation, you would just put 10 to the one. But hold on, uh, 10 to the one is 10. So 10, yeah. No, we so have 35, the, but we don't have 35, we have 3.5. Right, it would be 10 to the zero then, because that's one. That's right, because you didn't have to move the decimal place at all. Yes. So it's 3.5. So any number can be placed into scientific notation. 3.5 could be expressed if we wanted to is 3.5 times 10 to the zero. That's an important life lesson, all right? <clears throat> Let's queue up our next problem. So we have uh, 3.2 exp9 divided by 2.4 exp5. And we have an answer of 13,333.3333333. Now, once upon a time, when you took a math class, uh, they would have told you to make this kind of like 1.3 with a repeating line over the top, as if, as if it was infinite threes forever, right? That's fine if you're a mathematician who doesn't have any real work to do, right, Sage? But a scientist is concerned with the art of measurement and measurement is a dirty job done by dirty people with their dirty little tools all right and measurements <laughs> measurements are an art form as well as a science and they they have uh, a, a skill level associated with them and some of the skill level just has to do with the quality of the tools that you have to work with so for instance here's a here's a little meat uh you know kind of a I suggested that you guys get one of these, these simple plastic rulers. This plastic ruler has centimeters, all right? So there you can see one centimeter. It's about the width of your, your pinky fingernail. Notice this, this ruler is graded down into smaller tick marks. And these tick marks are, of course, called millimeters. And you can see that there's one, two, three, four, ten millimeters in one centimeter. So one centimeter is equal to ten millimeters. There's a conversion factor for you. One centimeter is equal to 10 millimeters. There's another way to look at this. If we do it in the other direction, one of these little guys, one of these little millimeters could be considered a tenth of a centimeter. So one millimeter could also be expressed as a tenth of a centimeter. I can see that this ruler has been graded down to the millimeter scale level. So when I take a measurement with this ruler, I know that if I'm competent and I take time to look at the nearest little tick mark, I should at least be able to measure myself down to the nearest millimeter. And when you take a measurement to the nearest millimeter or the nearest tenth of a centimeter, that is what we call the tolerance or what the machinist might call the precision of a measurement. The tolerance or the precision of a measurement, it tells you something about the quality and the care to which the measurement was taken. And in professional science and measurements, even in machining and carpentry, one has to specify the tolerance and precision of a measurement. There's a lot of science that goes into this. So let's take as an example, one of the other things we would have done um, one of the goals for today was to sort of measure the height of a lab partner. And that can be a fun icebreaker when people are in the lab room together. Kind of pointless to do when you're all sitting at home in your rooms. So I'm gonna measure myself as a way of talking about tolerance and precision, okay? So let me go grab a meter stick or two here. Got me a couple of meter sticks, okay? And um, you guys can see that these, these meter sticks are also graded down to the centimeter scale 
and even down to the millimeter scale, right? Just like my other ruler was. So if I measure myself with these meter sticks, a good workmanlike job would require me to have a tolerance of at least the nearest tenth of a centimeter or millimeter, however you want to look at it, right? The average human is about two meters tall, so I'm going to use two of them. I'm going to try not to screw this up. Clean my phone there, okay? Take out my my two meters, the bottom here. So this is at least a hundred centimeters, right? And now I will stand up, back straight, put this ruler across my head, and I'm clocking. 179.9, 179.9, oh wow, I kind of froze there. It's a flattering angle. Yeah, not really. Okay, but whatever. I just took a measurement of myself and I got 179.9 centimeters. Now, if I were to record this number on a stone tablet and bury it in the Rhode Island desert and future archeologists were to dig this up, okay? They would inherently know something about how careful I took this measurement just by looking at the number of digits in the number. They would say, check out this here dude. This dude was measuring himself and he took the time to measure himself to the nearest tenth of a centimeter out of almost 200 centimeters, right? Or out of 100 centimeters. So one way to look at this number is that this number has a precision. Here's how a scientist would say it. This number has a precision of one part in a thousand. Because if you measure my height to a tenth of a centimeter out of 100, that's the same as measuring to one part in a thousand. Another way to look at this number is to say that this number has one, two, three, four significant figures, okay? Or as the scientists say, four sig figs. Each of these numbers tells me something about the quality of the measurement. This tells you I'm taller than a munchkin, and this tells you I'm close to 180 centimeters, but this tells you if you actually look at the little millimeter tick marks that I was actually uh okay so that one's a little scratched up i really got to clean these things to see wd-40 or something but this means that that i was closest to that tick mark and not that one and not that one right that's what that tolerance means do you know that taking a measurement to one part in a thousand is a pretty sensitive measurement and that means that if i do this multiple times i would discover that microscopic fluctuations in my technique would lead to different measurements being taken. And this is what a scientist would call random errors or the noise, the noise floor. When you start taking measurements to the ability of your ruler's precision, you run into random fluctuations that inhibit your ability to learn the truth. So let's go ahead and just take another measurement, okay? Um, and I'll try to do it the same way I did before, but let's sort of see what happens here. I gotta keep it straight here. This was 180.7. Okay, it is what it is. Let's take a look at my data here, okay? So my first measurement gave me 179, uh, excuse me, 0.9 centimeters. The second measurement was 180.7 centimeters. What's the truth? Am I really 179.9 or am I really 180.7 centimeters? Or is the truth something different than all of those things together? Probably somewhere in the middle. What about outside, Ian? Could be outside, but could too, right? Yeah. We don't even know if it's in the middle. Let's take a third one to see if it goes in the middle or outside. Let's see what happens. Oh, 
180.4 centimeters. So it was in the middle this time, although I've had it come out the other way before. The only way to really be sure would be to continue to measure it over and over again, I guess an infinity number of times, and then you would be able to take the average and be sure of it. We'll just stick with three because we're kind of lazy today. Okay, so let's take the average of these. So we're going to add them up and divide by three. We'll do 179.9 plus 180.7 plus 180.4. We'll hit equals and then we'll divide by three. And sure enough, look what happens. 180 point, there's those three, three, threes again. Now, if you were to be silly enough to write down, if you were to write down all of those digits, you would be an ignoramus who didn't understand what you had been doing beforehand. Just because you divide by three does not know you mean you now know your height to the nearest hundredth or thousandth or ten thousandth or hundred thousandth or the nearest ten millionth of a centimeter. You didn't gain extra precision just because you divided by three. What are you supposed to round to, to be honest? A tenth? Yeah. You want to keep the same level of precision that went into your measurements. And if you had four significant figures going in, you can keep four significant figures coming out. And this is 180.3 centimeters. That's the best estimate of my height, okay? Um, computer scientists have a phrase for this. They say that garbage in is equal to your garbage that comes out of your equation, okay? You cannot have the end result of your computation be more precise than the materials that you put into it, okay? So usually we pick our least significant number and then we round based off that. So in that case, let's return ourselves over to, uh, to 3C here. How many significant figures does our top number have? How many does the bottom number have? Also two. So how many should we be allowed to keep? Two. So if I do 3.2 EXP9 divided by 2.4 EXP5, what should I round that to if I don't even use scientific notation at all? Uh, 13,000? That's right. I can keep this one in this three and all the rest of it goes flat. So if I was rounding correctly, it would be 13,000. And now notice that rounding is separate from scientific notation. If I were to put it into scientific notation, that would become 1.3 times 10 to the four. But you can round independently. Um, what I suggest to students is if you don't know what you're doing, just choose two sig figs when you round. And that's usually for astronomy purposes about good enough. But it's cool to know how to do it the right way from time to time. So why don't we guys, let's try the next one together. Okay, so we got 299792, 2.99792, exp8 divided by 5.520 EXP negative seven. Okay, so that's what the calculator tells us our answer is. Um, how many significant figures does the top number have? Six. How many does the bottom number have? Three. False, it has four. Oh, when counting. zeros come after a decimal point, they are significant. Kind of weird, right? Always forgot that one. I'll show you guys in a second a better way to do this. So um, uh, what should I round this to if I want to be honest? Sage? Is it four or the average? That's It's four because this is your crappiest number and your crappiest yeah. number pollutes the answer. So what should I round it to then, uh, Sage? Give me the final answer. Uh, let's make that 5.431 uh, 
times 10 to the 39 um, to the 14th. That's right. I'm sorry, I'm using my phone calculator. Oh, that's right. So 5.431 times 10 to the 14th power. The weakest number is four significant figures. The number that comes out is four significant figures. By the way, uh, let's talk about that for a second, Ian. Since you guys are a little more experienced, maybe it's time for us to have an adult conversation. The gold standard for years in physics and the book that I was trained on, uh, I was first introduced to in my experimental methods of physics class, which was like a junior or senior level class, actually like a really mind-blowingly cool class that teaches you a lot about stuff. Let me see if I can find you the book on this. It was a legend. Um, ah, here it is, right up here. Look, I've got it handy. This is Bevington and Robinson's data reduction and error analysis for the physical sciences. You can tell by the dog ears that it's got a quite a bit of years of use for me. And they opened their chapter basically with the same lesson that I just had for you guys. And here's what they say about uh, scientific notation and rounding. They of course have, this is a little more advanced than our class is ready to handle, believe it or not, because they really get into it. But I, I want to show you uh, what they talk about here. They talk about systematic errors and random errors. They talk about accuracy versus precision, all kinds of cool things. But here are their rules for significant figures and round off, which is a little more intense than ours. So what it says, and, and this is just in case you want to understand the actual rules, which I'm sure nobody does. Okay, so the leftmost non-zero digit is the most significant digit. That's what I call the lead digit. If there is no decimal point, the rightmost non-zero digit is the least significant digit. If there is a decimal point, the rightmost digit is the least significant digit, even if it is a zero. All the digits between the least and most significant digits are counted significant figures. What, this is why I don't give you these rules, but then they have a nice example. For example, the following numbers each have four significant digits. One, two, three, four, four sig figs. 123,400 has four sig figs. 123.4 has four sig figs, 1001 has four sig figs, a thousand with just the decimal point is four sig figs, uh, 0 0.0001010, that's four sig figs, these four are significance there. 100.0 also has four significant figures. So remember, uh, the rule is when you have a decimal point, Ian, zeros are significant if you write them after the number. Okay, these zeros up here, though, those are not significant figures. Yeah, Look, the only thing that's weird to me is that a thousand with just the decimal is still four, and like the zero that is technically next to it doesn't count. But right, so we don't need to get into that. I just thought that was that weird. that number it's has weird. one significant <laughs> figure, but if you put the decimal point there, it means four significant figures. I know it's crazy, right? I don't know. That's a bit extreme, but yeah, it's weird. <laughs> these guys are even more crazy. Our rounding rule is if the fraction is greater than a half, you round up. But these guys do like, if the fraction is greater than one half, increment the least significant digit. If the fraction is less than a half, do not increment. If the fraction is one half, so if you end up with a 0.5, Increment the least significant digit only if it's odd. That way, if you do multiple machine calculations, you don't like unnecessarily bias towards rounding up. We're not going to go that crazy, okay? If we have a number like 12.55 and we want to round that to three significant figures, if it's five or more, just make it 12.6, okay? Don't we don't have to get too crazy. Yeah. Uh, but I wanted you to know that people get nuttier. And by the way, that's chapter one. They get into some crazy stuff. This is just a legendary book. This is anyway. why I'm a big picture guy and I like biology rather than physics. <laughs> yeah. Although like sometimes it's cool to know them little details, you know? Okay. They certainly have their moments. Yes, absolutely. 
Okay, so how am I doing on time? I think that's about all I wanted us to do for a day. I just wanted to kind of practice with their EXP key. I wanted to see like what it looks like to put numbers in proper form and just talk a little bit about rounding, you know, kind of keep the significant figures coming out similar to the ones coming in. Okay, now we'll end lab and just take a couple of moments to talk about how to submit this. So this is all you guys need to submit for me today. Do you have that? Has everyone got that? Okay. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna stop the share. You, you said handwritten is okay, right? Yeah, handwriting the questions is okay. Yeah. All right. Also, um, in case you didn't know, you're still recording. Uh, let me tell you what I discovered having done this now for a few semesters. People just like Sage are doing take pictures with their phone and that's good Sage. But what happens is if you try to submit this using your phone, oftentimes a lot of messiness shows up. The things end up getting loaded sideways or sometimes they don't show up right. So let me suggest Sage that you do this in a particular way. I would like you to send that photo to your computer and upload it from your computer first. Yes, that's gonna take you an extra five seconds, okay? On the other hand, it seems to fix a lot of the problems because what happens, Sage, is if you guys submit the work and you think you're all good and cool, when I go and grade it later on on Sunday, if I can't read it, I'm going to give you a zero and move on. And you're not going to realize that you didn't get credit for the assignment that you did do. And that really worries me. So what I recommend doing is make sure that you can actually see the submission in the preview box, OK? So. Uh, I just want to get rid of that for a second. Let me explain here. Okay, so we're going to go to lab. This is how we submit. Um, from your computer, you'll click lab one powers of 10. And uh, what I want you to do is then you can upload the picture there. Now, yes, Sage, you could do that from your phone but it seems to work better, okay? Now, there are only certain file formats that I can accept. Um, oh, geez, I don't know. Let's just try this. Okay, so powers of 10, whatever. Let's say it's a PDF or something. PDFs work kind of good. Uh, I wanna make sure that you guys can see it. There should be like a little pre, is this what it looks like from your end? Yeah, that's basically how it looks. Yep. Um, I see a little box when I grade it. Why don't one of you try submitting it? Uh, can one of you who knows what to do, could you just submit it? I just submitted mine. Okay, so let's take a look at Ryan's and see if it came out right. So I'm going to go to Grade Center and Needs Grading. Ryan submitted his. So when I go to grade users, I want to be able to see his lab in the preview box and I want it to look normal. And that's great. You can see Ryan has written his stuff. Okay, his handwriting could use some work, but he's got all the right stuff there. Uh, <laughs> just teasing you, Ryan. But this is great because I can see it, okay? I can see this and it's previewed. I want to be able to see that when I grade it, and then I'll give you 10 points and we'll move on. I'm not going to grade yours right now, Ryan, because I want to wait until I have my grade book all set up, okay? So uh, Sage, Ian, and others watching, I found it works a little better if you upload it from your computer rather than from your phone, okay? That leads to fewer mistakes. Every now and then go and check and make sure you're getting credit for the things that you think you've submitted. Also be careful, if you exit out before it's finished, uploading, it will get locked in this version where I cannot grade it. And that's definitely caused a few people to miss points over the years. Ooh, excuse me. Okay. <clears throat> Is that all pretty explanatory? Guys, you got that? Sage, do you want to try and submit yours and see if it works? Yeah. Okay. Can you unmute yourself so I can hear you? It looks like you said I do. Yes, I'm sorry. I do. I am just looking for the preview and I can't find it. Um, just try uploading it and let's see what happens. I, I figured you guys would have a preview box, but I guess you don't. 
let's see here. Um, oh, it gave me the preview afterwards. Oh, okay. okay. But Does it, it look okay? Rotate. It just didn't rotate. <laughs> All right. That's what I'm worried about. Can you rotate that for me, dude? Yeah, I don't want to uh, sideways. I yes. I rotated it in my editor. I don't know what I guess just didn't save it. I'm I'm gonna post this video right here uh, in the announcement section once I'm done. That's what the live would it probably will take a couple hours to render this. So I'll change this not the live zoom anymore. So this is what I have to do, right? Stay tuned, okay? And then it'll take me an hour or two to get this video up. I'm about to stop it in a moment. Let's see if, or did you upload it now, bud? Sage? I am, uh, yeah, I'm doing it right now. I just wish you would let me see it before I submitted it. Well, just submit it and then let's see what it looks like. Yeah, just about there. And it's sideways again. Just sideways again? Yeah. Why does it keep going sideways? I'm um, not sure. I saved it as a completely different file this time. So that's kind of was it sideways on your phone? Um, doesn't seem like it. I can look. Um, what I think you should do is take go it to the, my computer. Well, sure. yeah, that's what I told you to do, right? Send it to your computer. And oh no. I mean, yeah, I've been emailing it to myself and uploading it on my computer, but I was just saying I could probably do it with the webcam and it might do it. Or what about like taking the image and then using something to rotate it, right? Well, that's what I did the second time and I saved it as a different file and like a completely different folder, but it's still... It's still coming out sideways? Yeah. That's evil. Why does it do that? I don't know. So I'm thinking I might just try and take a picture with my laptop. Um, See if I can make it easier. Um, here's another. Oh, Ian, I think one someone in your class has a great idea. There are these uh, apps that that take a picture right to PDF. Um, so why don't you look up a PDF scanner? And what it will uh, do is, I have a suggestion. I use Cam Scanner. It's a free app that, for all my assignments, I it's you can just find it. Ryan, it, it I use takes a I use. Of, and Ryan, same. I love I love Cam oh. Scanner too. Uh, that's a Google, That's an iPhone app. I oh, think yeah. Sage I think had a Google phone, right? Uh, seems like it's on both. Cam Scanner or there's one called PDF Scanner. Tiny Scanner, Tiny scanner says Jordan. Tiny so listen, any any scanner will scan it as a PDF, and that usually makes for a really nice upload. Usually the file file sizes are a bit smaller than JPEGs too, so they're easier to work with. So nice. Sage, if worse comes to worse, just upload it sideways and I'll try to understand. But I yeah, really I just, um, I feel bad. I don't want you to have like a million uploads. Yeah. <laughs> As, especially for homeworks and stuff. It's, it's, I have taken off a couple of points before if they're sideways all the time, if I can't read it. I don't, so yeah, I, I don't blame you. Um, but the first week I'll, I'll understand. I mean, just see if you can figure it out. Okay, buddy. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to end the video so it doesn't get too much longer. I want to start processing it too. Um, so do you guys have any other questions for me before we end for today? The, the basic plan is that we're going to get together to do the homework. We didn't train for all the problems, but whatever, we'll just do it anyways. We'll do the homework a little after 10 AM on Thursday before class. Okay. I actually did have a question I just thought of um, just yeah. for my own so I can keep stuff organized. Um, so basically what this semester is going to be is like what we would do in a week in one day, kind of. Right, yeah. For Ryan and Ian, during the spring semester, we, we had these nice luxury one and a half hour lectures followed yeah. by lab or followed by homework. Yeah. The problem is, Ian, in the summer class, we're obligated to complete the whole week's worth of stuff in one session. 
that means unfortunately we got to do homework then three hour lecture then lab yeah. so it's going to be trust me ian i was thinking to myself oh my god this is going to be pretty brutal yeah i have this and then another i have a bio lab science that also looks like it's going to be a lot so i just warn, to, that's I why i warn you guys taking too many summer class can be th the good thing about this class ian is once you're done and you log out you're yeah. done with your work for the day I, that's why i love this class it's great yeah and that's yeah. i've tried to make it that way because i think that's that's the way it should be so uh why don't we uh so good luck with that that's why yeah. get some coffee and some no dos or something okay yeah. uh <laughs> um but i'll see the rest of you guys thursday morning okay all right, and uh, great hangs. Sage, welcome to the class. Great to have you here. And uh, the rest of you cats watching at home, uh, uh, feel free to, oh, you got a little kitty there. Ryan, see you Thursday. Can't wait to see you in, uh, in, in virtual person for once. So get that camera, okay? Um, all right, everybody, I'll see you guys Thursday morning. Peace out.